Welcome to Submission Radio. It's the 7th of June and Dennis Skrautov here with Kaspar Ozalowski still trying to come to terms with Ben Rothwell and his amazingness from UFC New Orleans. Cass, <laughs> what an event this weekend. There is so much to talk about. I mean, from, from Ben Rothwell's robe to Ben Rothwell's entrance, his music choice, the sexy dancing. It's pretty much like a Ben <laughs> Rothwell show. I don't... Is there anything else to talk about? And of course there is. The whole card, the whole whole event was pretty spectacular. We're going to be breaking down majority of the card. Brian Ebersole retired. We're going to be talking about a whole bunch of things. And, of course, we're like your favorite uncle. Every time we come and see, we bring some gifts. <laughs> We've got some good guests this week. We've got uh, Talis Latis. He will be fighting Michael Bisping. He's going to be on the show to talk about that. whole bunch of other things. We've got... One half of Jackson Winklejohn's Mike Winklejohn returning to Submission Radio. Always love chatting to uh, Mike Winklejohn. He doesn't really pull any punches. He's an honest guy. Uh, lots to talk to him about. And uh, Yoa Romero. This is a first for us. We've uh, we've got Yoa Romero on the show. We've never done an interview with a translator. So uh, this should be a new experience for all of us, guys. Definitely stick around. And then, of course, we're going to be uh, breaking down the card UFC Fight Night New Orleans. So a nice and juicy show for you guys this week. Yeah, that's right. It's it's sort of the first step to us uh, working with the UN, you know, working with the interpreters cast. So it's going to be a very interesting uh, thing now. Guys, if you haven't yet, jump on Twitter. Follow us at Submission AUS. A lot of stuff to say, especially around the event time. Always have a lot of tweets out there and always a list Submission Radio news and interviews. And, of course, our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash Submission Radio AU. Check that out. Lots of interviews. Jessica I is up there. Stipe is up there. A lot of interviews. Our episode last week, lots of fun stuff from that so check it out and if you are listening on itunes um stitcher tune in anything like that you know if you enjoy the show uh pop down and leave us a review give us a like that kind of stuff really does uh make a difference for us and we really do appreciate the time if you do or have left a review for us previously it does, it does. And we do read all those reviews as well. We get the updates straight away. Same with any YouTube comments. We get the notifications and uh, we do our best to respond. Uh, definitely drop some comments below. If you are checking us out on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Every subscribe, every comment, every rating, we, we do see it all and we really, really appreciate it. Um, without further ado, guys, I pretty much have nothing else to say. It's a, it's a really packed show. There's a lot to discuss from the three guests that we have, and I feel like there's so many things to talk about from UFC Fire Night New Orleans. We're going to cut straight to our first guest. I believe he's officially on the line, and I believe Dennis will be introducing him. It's no secret that here at Submission Radio, we have a soft spot for our next guest. He's one of the best coaches in MMA today with students Cowboy Cerrone, Andre Arlovsky, Alistair Overeem, John Dodson, and Carlos Condit all picking up wins recently. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome back on the program returning guest Mike Winklejohn to Submission Radio. Welcome to the show, Coach. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Yeah, it's always great having you back on the show. It's been a while, actually. Now, you've been very busy over the last few weeks with UFC 187, UFC, 1, uh, UFC Brazil, some of the notable cars that you had fighters in. Is it safe to say Coach Wink is happy to be home in uh, Albuquerque with the family? Oh, yeah, I'm very happy to be home. It's been a, it's been a very good uh, run this year. It's, uh, we're on a roll. We're real happy with how things are going, no doubt about it. Yeah, well, I mean, let's let's talk about that role. Carlos Condit made a spectacular return of the Octagon in Brazil. We broke down the fight. It was a different Carlos Condit with a lot less footwork, standing more in the pocket. Just wondering, Wink, was that the game plan for this fight against Thiago? Well, you know what? What we weren't supposed to do is what happened in the first round. Of course, a lot of that has to do with ring rust. And, uh, you know, Carlos would, would hit him with a couple shots and then stand right in front of him. Not a lot of footwork, but uh, um, kind, of, kind of talking to himself about, uh, uh-oh, here I am again. Mm. But uh, honestly, Carlos sat down. He looked at me after the first round. He says, "Coach, I know," and uh, he knew what we had to do, what we had worked on, and uh, I reiterated a couple things. And a lot of it had to do with that the rising elbow, because the way Chago always covers when you throw your right hand at him, he always leaves that doorway open. And Carlos jumped on it right away, and and uh, we were successful. I was real happy. Yeah, um, we watched a breakdown by the one and only Jack Slack. He does really, really good breakdowns when it comes to striking. And, uh, you know, it, he, he mentioned how he, Carlos basically started off with his usual combinations. Then when they weren't working, he switched up and started using the elbows at close range. So just to clarify, that was pretty much how the first round was supposed to go in that fight. Well, no, the first round was, was uh, yeah, kind of like the second round, actually. Um, it was all a matter of, of going first and not being in range for lay kicks. 
Yeah. It, it, it was about being out of range for leg kicks. Um, and nothing wrong with going backwards and moving in circles, but when it's time to go, you have to attack from an advantageous place and then uh, put them on the field and go. And that's what Carlos did. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, Coach, because obviously elbows in MMA are sort of the new black. Everybody's loving them at the moment. Um, and you guys are some, one of the best camps that utilize elbows in your fights. Is that something that you guys have been working on in the camp, trying to bring it out more during the fights now, that you realize this is something that can really be used uh, during the fight pretty much? Oh, yeah. You know what? And it's nice because uh, I've been trying to get guys to do it for years, and, and uh, you know, John Jones is so successful at it. Hmm. Carlos might be better now. Um, it's uh, there's no padding there. What people don't understand, it, it, the, the NAs have a tendency to find those holes, and if you throw them at the proper angles, and you understand what's going on, it's very hard to defend. Boxers have no defense because you have basically you, the elbow can can either find the hole and or or can pull the actual defense, the actual frame out of the way, and 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 uh, it, it's just a neat thing. It's it's finding its home, and I think uh, that and forearms are going to become the, the next big weapon in MMA. Yeah, for sure. Now, yeah, in the first round, you know, Tiago looked pretty good, like you mentioned. Were you at all worried that the ring rust and injury may take Carl- Carlos a few rounds to wear off? Were you surprised when you saw him that way in the first round? Is that the way he was looking in training? Uh, no, not at all. Um, but I wasn't worried about it because Carlos is a five-round fighter, um, and the kicks that were hitting Carlos were slapping kicks through the top of his foot. They weren't his shin. Mm. So even though it was causing some redness and made a lot of noise, they weren't the kind of kicks that were going to slow him way down. I'm not saying it didn't hurt. <laughs> the mm. child kicked very, very, very hard, but uh, they were still at, at a range that Tiago was reaching a little bit, and so they weren't having as much damage. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, let's let's talk about Tiago just for a quick second. You were you were there ringside when you saw him take that huge punishment in the second round. Were you at all impressed with the heart that he showed in the fight? It looked like he'd keep fighting if the doctor didn't stop the fight. Mm you don't get any tougher than, than Tiago Alves. It was, it was incredible just to watch, uh, um, you know, Carlos is hitting him with things, and uh, he he's so strong and powerful. He's still getting up and uh, willing to keep fighting. I know he wanted to keep fighting at the end of the fight, but uh, there would have been just that much more damage. I, I'm really glad the doctor stopped it. But, uh, gosh, <laughs> my hat's off that that guy because uh, you can't get any tougher than that. And honestly, you know, it's... It, uh, the game eventually sometimes Carlos caught him. He caught him with a technique that we had was the first technique we worked on for that fight. And so maybe it was a little luck, but uh, um, t- it could have went the other way. Tiago's that good. Yeah, for sure. Now, uh, we saw on your Twitter that you tweeted, uh, the Carlos Condit's ready for that title shot. Let's say, hypothetically, if Rory McDonald couldn't fight and Carlos Condit got a fight against the champion Robbie Lawler in a couple months, you know how it is with the UFC and injuries. Do you see Carlos beating Robbie, and how would you see that fight playing out? Oh, yeah. I think uh, I, I love that fight. There's no doubt about it. I think Rob Lawler is great. He's been around a long time. Um, and we fought him before in the past with uh, Joey V. Senor. But uh, um, Carlos has the footwork on him. Carlos has the length on him. I think Carlos has the speed on him. I think Robbie is another Tiago Alves, as tough as they come. I mean, he, he, he will just throw down with anybody. But I think the technique's there for Carlos. I think he's matured. I think he's coming in with his knees bent. He's avoiding the takedown. So even with the Johnny Hendricks, I think we're on. And uh, it's time for a title shot. It really is. We can't wait to see what happens. It's such an exciting division. Now, let's jump to UFC 187. You were in a little bit of an awkward situation when you had Andre Olofsky fight your former friend and student and Olofsky's friend, Travis Brown. And you and Travis seemed really close, you know, when Travis was at the camp. Was it at all difficult for you to coach in this fight? And also, do you guys miss having Travis around at Jackson Winkle Jones? You know, Travis uh, actually brought a lot to the gym. He's 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 very athletic and very mobile. And at that long range, using his kicks, I uh, I was very worried about him fighting Andre. And uh, um, but he went to a boxing gym coach, and so I figured they were going to try to make him box, which worked out well for us because um, once we put him on his heels, it became all Andre. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like Travis focused more on boxing as opposed to footwork and the, the kicks that he used to throw. Have you noticed a big change in Travis's style? Well, it seems like it. Again, he was very successful against Brennan Schaub, though. So, mm. um, holy crap, you know, he had a great counter there. So, there's no doubt he got better at what he does. Um, I just more confident at that range. But, uh, you know, honestly, it, it could be a, um, 
mitigated and defeated if you, if you know what the guy's going to do. You know, if the person has more options, more tools in his toolbox that they're willing to use, I think is, is the guy that's successful in MMA now. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously, the fight was simply awesome. Andre got the big win and even took a massive shot. However, turned it around and was able to finish the fight off. Just wondering, the news came out that the fight almost didn't happen. Andre was almost close to pulling out with an injury. What, what exactly happened? What, what was this injury and how close was this fight to being called off? Well, um, in, in Andre's mind, it's never getting close to being called <laughs> off. It was the doctors that wanted to call it off. Um, honestly, he just... He, 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 he kind of tore his calf a little bit in that uh, he had a good good warm up a um, couple of days um, before weigh in and uh, he uh, um, kind of cooled down and got back up to do a little bit more and just moved quickly at, at those stupid little things and all of a sudden um, he couldn't put his foot down and uh, you know they had a, the doctors came in and, and had a look at it and they said it was ripped up pretty bad. And, it was one of those things that they wanted to put some ice on it and make it feel better and see how it was the next day. But uh, um, I think there were a lot of people concerned the day of the fight, um, even higher up in the UFC, that was that was where the, the fight wasn't going to happen. And Andre just looked at him and said, "I'm fighting." Wow, because that's kind of it. You know, Andre is that guy. He's he's uh, he's a stoic as they come, and he's he's game. Yeah, because I think we read a lot of the news websites that it was a. It, I think they were saying it was a sprained calf or a pulled calf. So it was actually torn, was it? Well, you know, what to strain, what to pull, you know, in my in my mind, it's always just, you know, mm-hmm. tears, little tears here and there that are causing swelling, causing bleeding, whatever the case is. But uh, I know it cramped up. I know he couldn't move on it. And I know Andre doesn't fake anything. Yeah. Um, and it, he wasn't using it as an excuse. He is going to go fight. So, and he did. Sure. I know that he's obviously not your student now, but what did you think of Travis's performance in the fight? Well, I, uh, um, I was glad we were able to do what we did against him, of course, because, mm. you know, he's no longer on the team. It's, uh, um, again, like I said, Travis has is, is, is got so many capabilities and he's a great guy. He's a great dad. You know, we wish him the best, but now I have a job to do and, and Andre is, is our guy. And uh, I think that uh, Travis made a few mistakes in that uh, they assumed Andre wasn't capable of doing a few things. I really think they thought they were going to counter his big overhand he kind of set him up for that. That was part of a game plan. And then also, uh, I think they thought they were going to back him up a little bit and put the pressure on him. So our game plan was not to back up in the slightest mm. and to push forward and get Travis on his heels and get past his long-range kicks. And we were hoping that he wasn't going to throw him on our way in, and, and he didn't. So we, we worked, they worked out real well. No, absolutely. And Andre looked great in the fight. Just wondering, Wink, um, obviously you and Travis had a close relationship before. Do you guys still keep in touch? And if he does one day decide to want to come back to Jackson Winkle Jones, will the door still be open for him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, he, he what was neat about Travis is he was always willing to help other people. And that's real important at our camp is, uh, you know, when, when a guy stops on time and goes and helps the, the guys that need help or whatever it is, um, that's real important. I think that's why we're real successful at what we do. The guy's a real big narcissist and is all by himself and comes in and, and acts better than others. Not only the coaches, you know, ostracize him and we tell him just he's an idiot, but uh, the, uh, the, the the fighters will either thump him and or do the same. So people understand it's kind of the unwritten law uh, of uh, of our gym is, is help others and Travis is always willing to help other people. Mm. Now, Andre Arlovsky has really had a new lease on life with his UFC, or sorry, his run in the UFC so far. What do you attribute this to? Was it a confidence issue before? And how far do you think he can go in the division? Can he win the big one? I think he wins the big one. Andre Arlovsky is very athletic. He's very tough. He's overcome so much. Um, I think he's on a roll and I think uh, I would love to see a title shot. I really would. Some people think think that might be crazy but uh you know andre's right there and uh he has a tendency to step up now and i think it's belief not worrying about his chin not worrying about things and we've adjusted some things understanding get him out of that the boxing style that he went with um and you know mma is not boxing it's not it's not the same in, in the slightest and i think uh, when he started thinking about a lot of boxing i think that's when we saw all all of his his uh, his failures just some little little things that, that were missing in his game that we brought back and added to. 
Yeah, I was going to say, a lot of people around 2010, 2011 were calling Andre's career dead. And uh, like you mentioned, the boxing, he was training with Freddie Roach and uh, was, you know, really, really just into boxing at the time, wanted to go out and box as well. And, uh, you know, people look at him now and, and instead of just throwing a lot of jabs, he's using that right hand a lot with the under, uh, the uppercuts, the overhands. Was that sort of a bu- part of the big, I guess, solution for you guys to almost recalibrate Andre Lofsky into being more of an MMA striker as opposed to a boxer? Exactly. I mean, that's exactly it. You know, Freddie Roach is, is one of the best in the world the way he does, if not the best. But uh, it's not MMA. And, and uh, it, it's a different range. It's a different distance. It's a different size glove. There's so much more going on that uh, um, I hope everybody else, other trainers and, and people aspiring to fight us, think it is about boxing because they seem to be successful against those. And yeah, you mentioned Freddie Roach. Obviously, the guy's a legend. But do you think that, you know, seeing as Andre is older now and he's having this kind of success, do you think that maybe if he sort of went to Jackson Winkle Johns a little bit earlier, maybe bypassed Freddie Roach at the time, do you think maybe he could have been having more success a lot earlier? Oh, I don't know. You know, I, I can't throw it all at Freddie. I can't throw it all at Freddie Roach. I mean, it's not. It's not that. It's just uh, you know, he 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 got in, the, in that bad role, tried some things that didn't work for him, um, and I think Freddie probably helped him with some power. Probably helped him, you know, work on some some techniques that maybe he needed to work on. But he, he forgot the footwork aspect, I think, and he forgot about different ranges and different defenses. And uh, do I think he would have done better if he would have come to us early? I would hope so. I would hope to think so. But, <laughs> mm. again, you never know because sometimes just some people have just the one bad fight and then confidence goes out the window or they have an injury, so you never know. But I, I would hope that, that uh, if he would have come to us, he would have been that much more successful that much earlier. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, Freddie Roach helping GSP out with the striking is also a great trainer and a lot of rights. Now, the tough thing in the gym right now, Mike, is Overeem, who's another fighter who you guys brought up and gave confidence to, and Andre Olofsky, they're in pretty close spots in the division, do you think this will cause any kind of issues in the gym? Because, I mean, who knows? If they both win their next fights, they could end up being tried to match, be matched up together by the UFC. Well, you know, it's the same thing as Travis and Andre. They helped each other get better, and it worked out. They both became two of the best in the division. So my mind is, I, I think, continue. Help each other get to the top. If you have to fight each other at the top, what a terrible, good problem to have. You know, now you, now you can make a lot of money because um, you got to fight somebody at the top, and it, it sucks that it's your friend, your training partner, but you wouldn't have been there without you each helping the other out. Um, so it's it better to be there even if you had to fight that guy than not to be there at all. So yeah, I absolutely. think keep training, keep working with each other, and, and get to the top. That's the key. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, there's been a lot of documented issues that the fellas had between each other. Olafsky going on record saying that he, he thinks this and that about Overeem. Do you think that will play into this whole thing at all? Will they be able to sort of help each other out? Are they at that point in their relationship, do you think? Uh, you know what? Uh, they have a tendency to, to, to kind of come in and help each other in camp and kind of miss each other as they go. You know, Andre's on his way out of the camp as, as, as Alistair's coming in and vice versa. Um, not too many of them have, have had like the whole like six, eight weeks together. Mm-hmm. But uh, I think heck up i'll probably demand they kind of help each other out as well i think they will um it's real important to do that to get better we need those big bodies you need that style and honestly they have so much to offer the other it's very important i mean uh, they're both so skilled at what they do it's incredible yeah i was just wondering andre he doesn't seem to be the biggest fan of over him just wondering do you know where that stems from what happened there Oh, I don't think it's that bad. You know what? Sometimes people take words and twist them, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I know I, sometimes, you know, a guy will get hit with a shot and he's pissed off because he got hit with a shot. The next day, the guys could be out hanging out together. If they weren't fighting, maybe they'd be drinking a beer. I don't know. But uh, um, and sometimes people say something and all of a sudden it, it gets replayed as being worse than it is. I don't, I don't really ever have, have heard Andre myself personally not like over him. You know, I, everybody in the gym every day. I hate to tell everybody, but that's what the guys do. There's fights in our gym. I know. People think that's crazy, but that's what we do. They fight, and then afterwards, they usually shake hands. Mm. When they fight, they get pissed. They get bad. They fight. And then it's over. They're men. And that's, it, it's a real hard thing for the average person to understand, but that's what these guys do. That's why they're the best in the world. So sometimes emotions get get uh, get picked up a little bit because of the fight, but then they think about it and go, well, that's what the guy's there for. He's there to make me better. What am I going to do? not get better. I'm going to get better because he hit me because he taught me how 
what I need to do for defense and what I need to do for the angle. So they're all better for it. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I mean, speaking of Overeem, you were on our show a long, long time ago and everybody was concerned what would be like when he came into the team? Would he be a team player? And now looking at him, you know, he's got this win streak. He's looking amazing in the octagon. You guys have completely switched up his style. He's a lot quicker, a lot leaner. You'd be pretty happy with the way this whole Overeem thing turned out, wouldn't you, Coach? Oh, yeah, very happy. I mean, I, we're lucky he came to the gym. You know, I hope he feels that way, but uh, I think he's made us look good. It's as simple as that. He's, he's been a pleasure to have around. Um, again, he's that guy that has been able to help others, um, and, and he's got access to different resources. He's got guys coming that are friends of his that are, are chiropractors and doctors, and, and they have a tendency just to help the other guys with the injuries, and, and uh, he's been great. You know what? Uh, he, he's been giving uh, you know, to the team, and that's been fantastic. Good investment. Uh, now, switching topics a bit, we haven't heard from Holly Holmes since UFC 184 when she defeated Raquel Pennington. We never got the chance to ask you about that fight. Many people said that they uh, would have liked to see her pull the trigger. What did you think about her performance uh, against Raquel? Well, with everything that she had in front of her, being the co-main event on her very first UFC fight, I thought she did great. People have no idea mm. what it's like, the octagon jitters, the first time someone walks into the octagon for the first time and, and, and is fighting in the UFC. And so many people have just froze and failed. Um, she was able to hit Raquel a few things, and then she stopped in time and go, um, okay, am I in the right position? And I overthought things, but very hard to explain, but fighting is all-consuming, and sometimes when you overthink it, um, everybody gets that cognitive freeze. There's so many fighters that have always say later, I don't know why I did what I did, but uh, you know, Holly just, you know, she, she slowed down a couple times and didn't pull the trigger in essence. Didn't, didn't do all the, the stamp things she normally does, but she st- stuffed every shot. Everybody saw how strong she was in the clinch. And, uh, you know, I thought she dominated the fight. And Raquel's no joke. The girl is very, very, very tough. Mm. And uh, they stay Holly, and they want that fight really bad. So, you know, onward and forward, and we'll see what happens here in our next fight here in July. Yeah, well, that's right. So, obviously, um, the deal with Holly is she, she lost a lot of time because of injury. What's going on with her? When can we sort of expect her to be fighting again? Is is there an opponent in mind? Is there a time frame in mind when she's coming back? Yeah, Marion uh, Renal, um, am I saying it right? Uh, she's fighting her. Um, it's been on the internet. Uh, it's already out there in July um, yeah. in San Diego. On the San Diego UFC card, she's fighting. So she's back. She's in training camp right now. Very good. We can't wait. Now, the end goal for Holly is, of course, Ronda Rousey and the bantamweight title. How ready do you think she is at the moment? Could she do it in her possibly next fight, the one after this one, or would you prefer to see her get some uh, more experience like against other girls? I like two fights. You know, I, re- I really would, just because the injury uh, situation put us behind a little bit. And uh, in her last fight with Raquel, you know, she was it's the first time she'd been hitting things really, really, really hard sense your injury and everybody you're still worried about it. no matter what people think you always worry about those injuries how you can perform um, um so that and getting rid of the jitters and, and, and starting to, to let loose i got to get a little more comfortable before she goes in there and fights ronda because ronda's scary and uh mm-hmm. you know ronda's going to come at come at holly and, and uh we don't need the octagon jitters and the nerves to be part of of, of, of our worry in that game plan so uh, we already have a plan of what we would do with ronda you know we're working on it all the time but uh yeah, Ron is a tough nut. She's the best in the world at what she does, and uh, uh, we're going to come for her. You know, Holly, Holly, Holly's going to get her. That's our goal. But I'll have to see a couple fights first. And just to confirm, as far as the, the fight against Marion Renault, that is official, right? Because last time we saw it was sort of in the works, it was possibly it was being reported, but that is officially on, correct? I think it's, well, yeah, I, I, I don't know if all the contracts are signed, but as far as I know, all the parties have agreed to it. Okay. So it should be good. Now, uh, now, obviously, the big deal, Wink, in the division is this whole Ronda Rousey, Chris Cyborg. Can Chris Cyborg make the way to fight Ronda Rousey? What's going on with her diet? Will it, will it happen? Back and forth, back and forth. Just wondering, what do you make of this whole situation? Um, what do you think about this craziness that's happening in the division? Well, you know, it, it's uh, um, yeah, that's a little WWE-ish, but uh, I think Cyborg <laughs> has, has, has got a lot going for him that uh, – uh, she can she can she can throw down. She hits very 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 hard. But with that being said, she also has the footwork of someone that just plods and throws very hard. And I think I think Ronda, Ronda will be able to slip under some punches and, and get to her uh, quite easily. I don't think that's the way to beat Ronda Rousey. You have, you have one shot at it, and it's over. Um, but 
uh, my money would go on Ronda for that fight. If she does make weight, because I think she'd be weaker than she ever had before, do the weight cut. Last time I saw her, she looked very big. Um, but I like to see it. She's very skilled, and uh, I like to see how Ronda responds to uh, maybe getting hit hard. Yeah, yeah, and she, you're right. She is looking really big. Now, Coach, before we ask you some fun questions, we just have to quickly touch on John Jones. Obviously, he's had some issues, most recently the hit and run. Um, unless, you know, people have been under rocks, they've all heard about it by now. Just wondering, you know, what was your reaction when you heard the news, when it originally happened? Well, disappointment. But, uh, um, you know, John is going to make the best of it. He's... he's uh, um, doing all the right things. He was in the gym helping Andre Olofsky for his, for his fight. He's in the gym helping others right now. So he's going back to help others, stop doing the things that, that uh, get you in trouble, and uh, go forward. And so I'm looking forward to John turning his life around and uh, becoming a better person. If he fights again or not, you know, I'm not sure, but uh, um, that's not important. What's real important right now is, is uh, John taking care of himself and his family. Yeah, no, absolutely. And obviously, everybody hopes everything works out for John in that regard. Just wondering, are you have you guys had a good chat? Do you guys sort of know where everybody stands? And are you guys sort of on the same page, I guess? Have you guys had a good chat about it? And is everybody in a good place right now in the relationship when it comes to John Jones and Jackson Winkle Johns? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, very good. He knows what we expect out of him. Um, and, and uh, you know, right now it's... it's uh, I expect him just to, to continue doing what he's doing, and that's you know take care of himself, do the right thing, take care of his family, and and uh, and, and he is. You know, I'm real happy with what he's been doing so far. You said before that obviously he's got to clear his stuff up, and everybody knows that he's got to go through the process and get this thing behind him. But you mentioned that you don't know at the moment if he'll if he'll you know fight again. Do you think that's realistic? Like I, I think there's a lot of people out there that are like, oh look, John Jones will fight regardless, regardless of what happens. Is is there any possibility that John Jones wouldn't fight again? Oh yeah, you know what? Because to us, the most important thing is is John Jones. You know, everybody, everybody seems to you know forget other things, but at the end of the day, it's. It, John Jones and and, and uh, become the best person he can. The fighter's secondary, and, and we lose sight of it. A lot, a lot of people lose sight of that and stuff. So um, there's a possibility that he might not fight. There's a possibility he might fight. I know right now he's uh, he's staying busy helping others in the gym. That's very important. No, absolutely. And obviously, like you just mentioned, he's in the gym. What's his vibe like? Is he able to block out all this negativity and really channel? You know, like you mentioned, what he's doing into helping others, or is it noticeable that, you know, he's quite bothered by all of this? You know, John's uh, um, just coming in the gym, doing his job. I, 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 yeah, I, he, he's, he's just focused on helping others. That's all I can say. That's, that's all I will say on it. Yeah, sure. that, that's the important part about it. I can't, you know, dig into his emotions or tell you anything about him personally, but uh, he, he's there to help others, which is very, very important to us. Sure. I've got second last question in regards to John Jones. You mentioned before that, you know, you believe that John Jones, a lot of people said that, oh, he has a drug problem. You said that he doesn't have a drug problem. It's just the people that he hangs around with. You know, afterwards, did it seem to you like John addressed those issues after his last incident and that, you know, he was on the right path? Uh, we were hoping he was on the right path. Uh, uh, and there you go. You know, I just, I'm really not really commenting about that right now because uh, we're still compiling information and making things right. So, Mm -hmm. I, I'd hate to be, you know, talking about John Jones about uh, you know, what was working, what wasn't working, and, and uh, anything like that. That's fair enough. No, absolutely. Now, I mean, the big question is: there's a new champion in Daniel Cormier. A lot of criticism from fans because obviously he lost to John Jones previously, and although he is the champion technically, a lot of fans feel like he's not the real champion. Um, what do you what do you think about this whole situation? Uh, you know what? He's got the belt. That's it, you know. Um, uh, John was the champ. He's no longer the champ. Daniel Cormier has got the belt. And uh, I saw a fight with Rumble. Uh, he, he deserves to be champion. And he took a <laughs> heck of a shot. They don't come in tough than that. Coming back, staying composed enough to, to slip under that punch and, 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 and take him down and go into his world. Um, he deserves to be champion. You know what? Daniel Cormier has been nothing but respectful and courteous but when I've talked to him. And, and uh, as has been Rumble. Um, these, these, are, these guys are great, and there's no reason to take any of that away from him. Uh, he, he's a champ right now. He's a UFC champ, and I wish him all luck. 
We're going to jump to the tap out round in just a second, but um, just in regards to DC, I mean, he said that he was very emotional in that John Jones fight. Can I understand that, you know, it would have been different than really any other fight, the, the emotions, the title fight. Did you see a different Daniel Cormier in this fight as opposed to the one that fought John Jones? Um, I don't think there was much media involved with it. It's maybe a little bit less emotion, but uh, Daniel still does the same things that he did with John that we had, we had uh, um, scouted. So he didn't look a lot different in this fight. Um, you know, uh, he, he was successful, susceptible to the same thing, just uh, Rumble throws different things. It was just a different fighter. So um, I think Daniel was the same guy that he was when he fought John. I'm not sure what changes he made. He looks the same guy. He's very good at what he does. Absolutely agree. And interesting to see what happens in the division next. Now, uh, we're going to wrap up the interview with thing we like to call the Submission Radio Tap. Or add Coach Wink, you've done a number of these fun questions. And the first thing that comes to mind, okay? Are you ready? I'm a little nervous, but yes, sir. <laughs> well, this is gonna, we're going to kick it off with the toughest question. What's Coach Wink's favorite tank top in the massive tank top collection that you must have amassed over the years? Uh, cut off sleeves. Uh, Kyle and Oak, all the guys make fun of me because I always <laughs> wink a wise there by the shirts. I just cut off the sleeves like uh, the old white guy that I am. <laughs> now, around the same time as John as Jones was, hit in the, was in the hit and run, Arlovsky was also in a car accident. What's the deal with these Albuquerque Rose? They never seem so bad in Breaking Bad. You know what? People in Albuquerque are crazy. I think it's just a high altitude, less oxygen going <laughs> to their brains. Now, you were obviously in Brazil recently. Tell us about your experience in Brazil. Any crazy stories to share from your time there? Uh, you know, fire ants bit my ankles. I'm coming home with a whole <laughs> bunch of, uh, uh, of, of, of of lumps on my legs. I don't know why. Just walk into the mall one day. Fire ants, man. The silent killer. What's the deal with the crowd down there? The arena looked really empty on TV. Well, I heard the, the economy is real bad down there. I think that's what it was all about is... Uh, uh, times aren't good for that city with what's going on. Mm. Now, new dorms are opening up at the Jackson Winkle John uh, gym. I'm just wondering, Coach Wink, where will you? Wh what's a place that you like to take the new students out when they first come into the dorms from a different country? Taking them out. Is, is it a part of the out. program? <laughs> well, you know, no, part of the program is not taking them out. How we take them out is we take them to the mountains to run, to uh. run and they get to mile high, so we take them two miles high to make it worse for them. Um, or we take them out in the sun on the sand hills and make them run them down the sand hills. Welcome to Albuquerque. Yeah, wow, you're not well, selling this thing for a lot of people here <laughs> in Australia, <coach. laughs> Is there anyone that gets disappointed? You're like, all right, guys, training's finished. You're going to the Mile High Club now. And they're like, what? Awesome. Like, no, 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 not the Mile High Club, just Mile High. And then they get there and they're like, wow, <laughs> totally, that was not totally what we expected. Club. Totally different club. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Greg Jackson seems like a fun guy. What do you guys like to do uh, together to take the load off? Or is it oh, like, or is it like training finishes and you guys just go your separate ways? We pretty much train and go our, go our separate ways. Uh, just you know, he goes home to his family, I go home to my family. That's the most important. Yeah, it's like me and Casper. We get so much of each other after the show. We didn't see each other for weeks. We're not even now. really friends. <laughs> yeah, I don't even know who he really is now. Um, give us your thoughts on Keith Jardine's performance in the Keanu Reeves film John Wick in his fight fight scene against uh, Keanu Reeves. Did you watch this and give us your breakdown of it? No, I didn't. But you know what? It had to be good because Keith can just look at people and scare him. So. Um, I did not see it. I guess I need to watch more movies. Yeah, no, I don't want to give you any spoilers, but Keith en ends up losing, so you might have to watch the tape with him. <laughs> <laughs> it tells me that was set up. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Yeah, people are saying it was a work. Uh, Mayweather versus Pacquiao. Do you want to see the rematch? Not really. Um, I, I don't. I wouldn't want to see the rematch, but I wouldn't blame them if they did. There's a lot of bunny on the table, and, and holy crap, good for them. Tell you what, I wouldn't pay ninety nine dollars for it. That's for sure. Now, no, sir. now, Wink, do you think Jesse Pinkman would have been less of a screw-up in Breaking Bad if he did some sort of martial art at Jackson Winkle Johns? I, uh, I think he would have been a little more calm and not so, <laughs> so fast to pull the trigger if mm. he would have trained with us. He would have been used to, to um, being under fire a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, second last question, Coach. Now, you're obviously a family man. What's the secret to a successful marriage, Wink? Uh, yes, dear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh man, no wonder my relationships keep failing. And finally, give us the prediction out of all of your students. Who do you think will be bringing gold back to the gym in 2015? Two of them: John Dotson and that Cowboy Sterling. 
There you go. Can't wait for both of their fights. Can't wait to see what's happening next with everyone from Jackson Winkle Johns. Guys, you can now travel to Jackson Winkle Johns and stay in a dorm while training. Make sure to email them at jacksonwink at comcast.net for more information. Of course, follow Coach Wink on Twitter at MMA Coach Wink. It's always a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for coming back and chatting with us. Hey, guys. It's been fun. Thanks for having me. Hey, what's going on, guys? It's Demetrius Johnson, the UFC flyweight champion of the world, and you're listening to Submission Radio. All right, guys, our next guest is coming back to the program. He is main eventing the first UFC card ever in Scotland, UFC Fight Night 72 Glasgow, and he will be taking on the Count Michael Bisping. The fight, of course, is on July 18th. He is Talis Lates. Welcome back to Submission Radio. How are you, Talis? Hey, thank you, guys. Thank you. I appreciate the time. No, no, it's, it's always great having you on. You know, we've uh, we've obviously seen that you've got this big fight going on. You've been saying that you're interested in fighting Michael Bisping for about six months now. How happy and relieved are you that you've finally gotten the fight? Yeah, I'm I'm very happy. This is one of the fights that uh, I would like to 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 make a long time ago. Bisping is a a fighter for a, a veteran, a UFC veteran like me since 2006. And uh, I would like to fight with him for a long time because his fight style is nice. He fight forward, and he 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 knows how to move the the fights very well. And you know, he's a great fighter. He fight forward. He fought against tough fighters in the world, you know. And all his losses was against tough fighters, and he deserves he deserves a lot, in my opinion. He deserved the the chance to the title shot once, you know, before. But uh, he he was almost having the chance, but you know, he he, he was just needing one more victory, and then he lost to the but he lost to the tough fighters. Mm. No, absolutely. I mean, a lot of a lot of different people have gotten title shots before, and you'd think with what Bisping has done, he'd be one of them. So it's a great point that you've made. Now, you're in a five-fight win streak and in the UFC, about to headline a show with Bisping. And in 2009, as we spoke about previously, you were cut from the UFC. How proud are you of being able to turn everything around and make it back into the main event spot, which is something very few fighters have been able to do. How proud are you of just being able to do that alone? Oh, I'm proud of me for sure. Proud of me of my all my my success, all my my know all the training, all my teams, all my all my coaches, everybody. You know, I'm proud of everybody. Not on not not only by me. You know, but you 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 cannot go anywhere by yourself. You need the you need the support, and I have a, a good people supporting me every time. Now, you'll also be headlining the first ever UFC card in Scotland. What do you think about that, and how do you feel about traveling all the way down to Scotland? Yeah, I think it will be nice. It will be great there, because <laughs> uh, one of my dreams is visit Scotland. i never been there, and I would like to see Scotland. How is it in Scotland? See the crown and, and all this, these things. And uh, I'm a big fan of uh, the Braveheart, the Braveheart the movie, mm-hmm. and... <laughs> who, who who tells the story of the William Wallace, the the hero who helps to the the Scotland against the the English and a long long time ago. But you know that movie inspires me a lot, and I have a tattoo with a this a William Wallace word and a sentence. Really? In my la yeah in my left hips. Wow. Great. So is it, is there any chance for the walkout? We might see you don the face paint and walk out in the sort of Mel Gibson costume. Maybe why not? Why not? If the if the if the, the the Scotland crown like it, I will do it. No problem. No problem. Representing William Wallace. Well, I think I think they would definitely love it. And of course, you know, it is the story of the Scottish going up against the British. Michael Bisping. You know, he is from from uh, from Lund- uh, from the UK. From yeah. What 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 am I going for? He's from Britain. Now, have you done much in? Uh, have you done much research about the country? Do you know much about Scotland, Talis? Uh, I know a little things about Scotland. I know that Scotland is a part of UK, and uh, Scotland speak you no know, English like the, you know, uh, uh, like the, the the England, and it's a gorgeous country. Probably, you know, I saw just some pictures, and that's it. I would like to. I want to go there and see, you know, and feel that that feeling. See the how the crown will, you know. Will reset, will reset me, and all these things will makes me, will makes me more strong. 
Yeah. We've actually, it's good that you you do know something about Scotland because I was going to say, we've done our research, Talis, and we're going to help you. We're going to lay the foundation by telling you a few facts about Scotland. You tell us if you've heard any of these before, all right? Did you know, first off, that Scotland's official national animal is the unicorn? Mm. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't know. Is the unicorn? Oh, <laughs> the mythical I didn't creature. Know. Mm, I didn't know. It's nice to know. I, yeah. I, will, I will see more about Scotland uh, on the internet. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, well, you don't even need to. You don't even need to Google. We've pretty much Googled everything there is, and we've got about three more yeah. facts. And if you do go, if you go, do go to Scotland, I mean, whip out the unicorn stickers, put them on you, put them on your backpack, yeah. on your crew as well, and I guarantee you they'll love you there. Did you know, Talis, that in Scotland there is a type of soup called, uh, it's a cock a leaky, cock a leaky. No, I didn't know. Is that that? <laughs> is that that? What is the name? Cock a leaky. Believe it or not, <laughs> I think they would pronounce it cock a leaky. It is true. It's true. Well, a lot of, a lot oh, of yeah, Scottish fans turning the show off right now. <laughs> Imagine that. You go to a restaurant, you're like, what's the soup of the day? And the guy's like, cockaliki. <laughs> cockaliki. Yeah. It looks funny. <laughs> Cream-based soup. Now, did you know that Queen Victoria smoked cigarettes when she was in Scotland to keep midgets away? What is, what is, I didn't understand what it said, I'm sorry. I, I didn't even understand it the first time I read it either. Queen Victoria, when she would visit Scotland, she smoked cigarettes to keep midgets away, the little people. To keep what away? Midgets. You midgets, know, like, what, what it means? Midgets, so you know. Smaller people. Sh yeah, the, the, the short people, the smaller people. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> it is weird, huh? Really weird, man. Cigarettes, yeah. the, the midgets weakness apparently, I didn't know this. And yeah. what, just another fun fact for, you know the bagpipes, those instruments they play? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Beautiful music. Well, it wasn't the Scottish yeah. who invented them, it was the Romans. Mm. Is the what? The Romans. Romans. What yeah. is what it means? It Romans. They, they it, invented it. Pe people from Rome, the Italians, they invented the bagpipes. Oh really? Yeah. Nice. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> so there you go. I yeah. like the. Yeah, I like some Scotland songs, like the Braveheart movie. You know that. Uh, what the name that you say that they they, they sing? They it's very famous in a. You 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 just mentioned the, the name. Uh, uh, the bagpipes. In Portuguese we call. Yeah, exactly. What the name? Bagpipes. Bagpops. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so in between like wrestling, jiu-jitsu and like, you know, striking, just fit in a few bagpipe sessions and they'll love you down there in Scotland. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful song. I like the noise. It's good. <laughs> now, let's get back to the fight, um, <laughs> in, in the In this fight, people, a lot of people are favoring Michael Bisping, saying that you don't have much of a shot against him, obviously, because he's such a tough competitor. What do you see as your advantages over the Brit? Uh, I don't care. First of all, I don't care if people say if he is the, you know, the if I will be the underdog and if he will be the favorite, I don't care. When we got inside the cage, it just me and him and we close the cage, we will figure out who will be the, you know, who will be the, the best fighter in that night. And I think that's, this fight is perfect to me. You know, I will fight for, for, for sure. And probably he will fight for too. We will we'll, we'll be collide every time, you know. I will I will fight on stand. I will fight on the uh, um, taking downs. I will work my takedowns and we'll fight on the ground. Of course, that I, I won't just looking to take him down every time. The fight, the, the MMA fight started on stand and we'll, you know, develop on stand. We will see, you know, what will happen, you know. Who will feel the, the heavy hands first to try and take down or to clinch something like that mm -hmm. yeah we'll definitely see you know in your last fights you've been a lot more content to stand up on the feet you got the francis come on knockout against tim boach you spent a lot of the early part of the fight against him uh, on the feet michael bisping's been successful beating most of his opponents with a silky smooth footwork will you feel comfortable in the striking department with michael and how do you stop him from trying to beat you with his large volumes of punches how how, how will you stop him well, yeah, like if if Michael Bisping is doing the usual Michael Bisping routine, which is a large volume of punches in and out with footwork, you know, how are you gonna yeah. how are you gonna prevent that from happening? No problem, no problem. We have a plan. We have a plan for all the situations. Don't worry, don't worry, because we are we are watching a lot of his fights. We are we already know a uh, game plan to this fight, and this fight won't go to the to the end. This yeah. fight won't go won't be in the at the judges' hands for sure. Well, let, let me ask you this, Talis. Bisping is known for his take down defense. Do you believe you'll be able to take him down and submit him in this fight? Sure, for sure, for sure. I will knock him out or submit him. 
You can, you will see. You can write it, and you will see. I'm, I'm typing it as we speak. Now, uh, your coach, Andre Padaneris, he said that after this camp with Jose Aldo, he will retire as head coach of Nova Onia. Were you surprised when you heard the news, and what does this mean for you? <laughs> no, I hope I hope it, this is just rumor, because, you know, if if uh, if that there get retired, we will be, you know, like a, a son without without father for us he's mm. like a father for all, all of us you know uh, i i hope it's just a rumor i didn't i didn't ask him about it but you know he's he is doing he he was a fighter and now he's a coach for a long time he has a lot of uh, students but you know I, I i will talk with him about the situation but i i hope no you know a lot of people you know like uh, for novo Neon, all of us love him, and we we will miss him for sure, you know. But I hope it is just a rumor. I will talk with him about it. I hope it is not true. That's right. Have a stern chat. Just wondering, Taos, how much of an influence has Andre been in your MMA career and progression as a mixed martial artist? Uh, to me, you, you mean to yeah, me? Yeah, to yourself. Yeah, how much of an influence has he been, Andre? Oh, no, a lot, a lot, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. My. You know, when I start training MMA with Andrea, he's a, like I said, he's like a father for all of us. He knows a lot of things. He has a vision when he see the fights and the training. He knows all his students very well, very well. If he's, he, he looks to my face, he knows if I'm tired, if I'm happy, if I'm not happy, what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. It's, it's amazing. You know, especially when I'm fighting, and he's in my corner. It's it's unbelievable because it's uh, it's like he's playing video game. You know, if you hear him, you will you know, if you hear him, you will do the the, the right for sure. Because he has a, a big vision, you know, clear vision. Mm. Yeah, he sounds like the type of guy that you really you know need in your life, especially as a mixed martial artist or <laughs> yeah. as a fighter. You know, I think with Andre, what he's going to do, he's he's going to retire as the head coach. He'll probably still coach at uh, Nova Unia, but someone else will sort of, you know, take the reins of the head position. I'm just wondering, you know, let's say, you know, Andre says to yeah. you, look, Talis, I'm only going to be training with, you know, Jose. I'm only going to be training with these guys. You know, would you still stay at Nova Unia permanently or will you possibly look to, you know, try out some other camps in Brazil or possibly even America? I will be where where my team is. I will be mm. where Andre is. Whatever mm. he say, I will do whatever he say. You know. Mm. Nah, absolutely. If he say let's let's tune with Novunion, I will be Novunion. I'm Andre Pinedo's students. I will be for him to the end. Nah, absolutely. And obviously, um, you guys have an amazing team there. And you know, just quickly sw- switching gears to Jose Aldo. Obviously, he's fighting Conor McGregor in what what will be one of the biggest fights in the UFC. And we had, we had a brief chat about it previously, but now that the fight is sort of coming pretty closely, how is he looking in training? Is he looking good in training? He looks excellent, excellent. Like all the times, he looks excellent. And physically and mentally, his mental game is too strong. It's unbelievable to see how he he's uh, confident about himself every time. Doesn't matter doesn't matter what situation he is during the training, he's always confident, you know. He you know, his fight style, you know, everybody knows, but his game plan is awesome. It's absolutely awesome. Yeah, you mentioned you mentioned how, you know, confident he is in the mental game. I think that's actually a big sort of thing that people are wondering about because obviously we spoke to you last time before the UFC 189 tour. Uh, the the world tour where the the belt grabbing happened and you know these guys really got on each other's nerves. Being that you know him better than us, you know, did Connor's relentless trash talk affect him? You know, he obviously didn't want to be touched, and Connor touched his back and grabbed the belt. You know, is he going to be emotional during this fight? Yeah, this this fight will be amazing. We will see. Uh, although he's you know he's ready for everything. You know, like I like I said, his mental game is perfect. And his strength, you know, all his, you know, he, he looks physically very well. He's 100%. And he will be 200% during the fight. You'll see. How do we be on fire there? Yeah, absolutely. Are you still, are you still sticking to your prediction that um, I believe he said you thought your prediction is Aldo is going to be uh, KOing? I think he mentioned. Uh... Yeah, until the third round. Okay, so I third round, I, I, this is the. I'm going to. Uh, we're taking bets here, Talis. <laughs> yeah. Third round. yeah, 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 yeah. Where, where's the it, money? Until tells? the third round, until <laughs> the third round, you know, because the first round is more one of, one of them student one one student or each other, 
but you know after the first round it will be more more much more aggressive of course everything can happen during the first round even studying keeping the distance in all the situation you know um his opponent fight for every time you know and if he comes he will receive a big shot for sure Okay, just just checking for all the fans listening at home. Now let's uh, switch gears back to Michael Bisping for a second. Against CB Dolloway, Bisping got caught with some punches that many believe the old Bisping wouldn't have been hit with. Some people are even saying that he's slowing down. Obviously, he had the eye injury, and a lot of people are saying he's not the same fighter since coming back from the eye injury that he had, the detached Ratna. Just wondering, um, what are your thoughts about that? Do you think Bisping is slowing down in his career? Oh man, to be honest, I didn't know if that he had an eye problem before. I didn't know that situation. But, you know, I think he, he he's he's still a pretty dangerous fighter. He fight four, he has a, a big uh, a, a big volume of the of punches. He he use his his feet every time. He move every time. He don't, he don't stop. And he has a great cardio, you know. He's one of his big weapons. He has a great cardio and big combinations, you know. He's pretty dangerous. I don't see him, you know, in a in a in a downhill. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I don't I don't see him going down. I I I still see him one of the one of the top fighters in the UFC. Contrasting to yourself, where you certainly are not on the down slope at all. You're currently on an eight fight win streak. Five of those coming in the UFC with a win. Over, you mentioned that there was times where Michael Bisping may have deserved a title shot with the win over Bisping. Do you think it puts you up there with you know Jacare Souza and Luke Rockhold as a contender for a title shot? That would then be six uh, fights in a row in the UFC for you. Yeah, I'm, 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 a lot of people ask me this, 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 this question. But you know, I prefer don't think what what will be after this fight. I prefer put all my mind in this fight now, and then after this fight, if I win him, of sure, of course, I will see what will happen. I don't want I don't want to think about title shot now. I don't want to think about nothing. Uh, there's a excellent guys, you know, almost with the the chance to fight for the title you know and he, they deserve this this chance you know of course and i just i i, I have to fight with Bisping first he's a you know tough opponent i have to win him and then we will see what will happen i don't like to think a lot of uh, about the uh you no know, uh distance future you know what i mean i prefer mm -hmm. eat, uh, live day by day and my next goal is Bisping. you know and this is all i want now no, absolutely. And that, that makes a lot of sense, Tails. Now, let's talk about the middleweight division a little bit. You're obviously currently ranked ninth. What did you think about the Weidman Belfort fight? Did you have any takeaways from that fight? Uh, the last fight, the last time, yeah. the last time. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I thought, I saw the fight, and I think the Vitor, he has a great chance. You know, um, uh, the champion, he felt his hand, but. He's, you know, other time he's he's uh, he's young. He's he's the champion, and his mental game is awesome. He has a a great mental game. He was in a really hard situation, and he keep calm. You know, if you see him fight, he was calm. Even even Vitor almost knocking him out, he was calm. He was bleeding, but he was calm, just waiting for the right the right moment to do his stuffs. And when he saw a chance, he took him down and, you know, smashed Vitor and finished the fight. I think Vitor was kind of frustrated because he, he didn't, you know, knock him out. And then his, you know, I think uh, because the frustration out, his system in was out and, you know, uh, the champion is the champion. And he, he did his, his job. Mm. One of the biggest. This is my opinion, of course. This is my opinion. I don't know exactly what happened inside the cage. Only Vitor can can say the truth. Yeah. But it was was what looks like to me. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it, it, yeah. It's good that you're saying that because one of the biggest questions I wanted to know was, you know, when when he got taken down, Vito Belfort. You know, he was in, I believe, the guard or half guard, and uh, you know, it just Vito Belfort being, you know, good black belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, he was doing mm -hmm. certain things that a lot of people were questioning. You know, Jacare Souza, he had a few things yeah. to say about him. What did you think of of it once the fight hit the ground? Having such great Jiu Jitsu like yourself, what what did you think? 
Yeah, he he is really a black belt from a you know a a great a great teacher you know mm. Carson Gracie. But mm-hmm. I don't know. I prefer don't don't say nothing about it because you know I don't know what happened inside. You know I don't know if he felt some punch. I don't know if he was injury. I don't know if he was frustrated. I don't know. But what I what I can say what that is. That jiu-jitsu is not, you know, a, a high-level jiu-jitsu that we show, that he show it mm-hmm. inside, it, you know, during the fight. But of course, I don't know what happened. Just him can say that, you know, what real happened inside. You know, I, I'm, I, I'm, uh, as a, you know, expector watching the fight looks weird for everybody. Everybody was asking the same question. Hey, what happened? He looks a blue. He looks like a blue belt fighting against a, a black belt. You know. But yeah, yeah. you know, I prefer don't 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 give my my thoughts about it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, obviously, in the fight, a lot of fans are wondering if uh, Vitor will be the same fighter now that he's off the TRT. Me and Casper spoke about the fight on the show, and personally, our thoughts were that he didn't look the same off to TRT. He looked a lot older. Do you think he can still perform to the same level now that he's off TRT? Because he did to us look very different to the Vito Belford that fought previously. Uh, to be honest, I don't think that he will be that uh, the same Vito as his last fights without TRT. You know, because the TRT probably give, gives him more confidence for sure, mm-hmm. more stamina, and more you know more when I mean gas. You know, and of course he will be always a dangerous fighter for sure. But as you no, know, like we saw, I think without TRT he was still being really, really dangerous. But his stamina won, won, you know, won, won going to the end of especially five rounds. I don't know, you know, mm. this is my opinion. Okay, once one like I'm, I'm just thinking because he was using TRT for a long time. Mm-hmm. His body was used to do it, you know, his mind. Every time with TRT, no, I'm now I'm confident, I'm strong, I'm everything. And without mm-hmm. TRT, his mind going down for sure, mm. you know. And ob- obviously his body too, you know, but yeah. much more his mind. Yeah. yeah, the body looked completely different now. <clears throat> now that that fight's done, Vito Belfort, Chris Weidman, I feel like the log jam is finally unclogged in the middleweight division. We can move on, look to different fights. Big debate now is who gets the next title shot? You know, a lot of people are saying Luke Rockhold. It seems to be the one that uh, a lot of fans want. What do you think? Should it be Rockhold? Should it be Jacare? Who should fight Weidman next? My opinion, I think the, both guys deserve the title shot. But to be more, you know... Um, uh, how can I say? Specific. It's not just, yeah. Specifically, yeah. Of course, uh, fight uh, Jacare and uh, Hawk Hold for C to see who wins the has the 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 right to to for the title shot. So number one, con- number one contender, Rock Hold versus Jacare, and then whoever wins gets Weidman. Exactly. Exactly. Well, this is my opinion. That's a different angle on it also. Mm. Very, very interesting task. Now, we're going to do a little thing that we like to do here at Submission Radio called the Tap Out Round. It's based. You've done this a few times. You're a bit of a veteran of this now. It's where we throw some fun questions at you and you answer with the first thing to come that comes to mind. Okay, Talos? Okay. Okay, so here we go. What's one submission that you have trouble going for when rolling? What's one submission move that you you just can't get right? What's one? Give us one. Uh, I don't know. Hand tra- Just good at no. everything. Uh, <laughs> triangle. Uh, yeah, no I don't way. know. I'm not good, no but way. I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, it's not. I like, I like a lot of submissions, but let's see. Real Nike choke. Yeah. That you're not good at, though. What's one that you're not very good at? <laughs> this, this is one that you have trouble, uh, trouble hitting. Trouble like with, a submission yeah. that you're always like, ah, I want to get the submission, but you always find it hard. What's, what's, what's your white whale, Talus? Ah, uh, man, I think it is triangle, maybe. Triangle, you find it no hard way. to get the triangle. You'd, you'd get triangles Sometimes on people because it's, it's, it's a Tuesday. I mean, I mean, during an MMA, it's not easy to get triangle. It's not yeah. easy. Well, the good thing is we've got a submission technique of the week, Talos. Every week, a new technique. So you can always check that out. We've got one, we've got one actually <laughs> probably next week coming out with a triangle. What's your favorite guard to work from off your back in BJJ? I mean, you know, there's so many guards now, spider guard, uh, worm guard, everything. What's your favorite guard to work off? What's my favorite? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Sorry, God. God. Yeah. In in Brazilian jiu-jitsu, um, from your open guard or closed guard, how do you like to work off your back? 
I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. I mean, I, I, I understand God. God the Almighty? No, 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 no. You, um, you know, like, you know, in Jiu-Jitsu, how there's, like, uh, different guards. So if you're on your back, there's full guard, and then there's half guard. Uh, guard, guard. You mean guard? guard. Yeah, 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 guard. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite I, guard I, to work from, Talos? <laughs> okay, okay. I like, I'm sorry. I, I, like the, I like half guard. I like half guard or butterfly guard. Yeah. Oh, wow. Half guard. Now, do you think there's a problem with PEDs in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu competitions? Because we've spoken to a few guys like Kid Dale and other guys that are involved in the community, and they think it's a little bit of a problem now. What is PD? I'm sorry. Uh, PED, yes. sorry, like performance enhancing drugs, like sort of like steroids. Oh, or, okay. Yeah, okay. Kind of I, yeah. I, think, I think it's great, especially in a, in a Jiu Jitsu competition. You know, the, the rules is for everybody. You know, mm. I think it's in during in all the sports, the rules for everybody, not for only one, two, or who is in the top. It's for everybody. Okay. Uh, tell us, we've heard some rumors. Is it true that after you beat Michael Bisping, you will catch the Loch Ness Monster? <laughs> if, I, if I beat Michael Bisping, I'll be what? You, you'll catch the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> it's, the, it's the legendary monster that's terrorized Scotland for years and years oh, and years. Oh, yeah, I know. The... the, 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 the the uh, Lake Ness, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the one. Uh, I don't know. If he's up here, I can, I can choke him, maybe. <laughs> Got to work on those triangles, Talos. Loch Ness. <laughs> maybe, maybe. He has a big neck. It's good, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, you've got a young daughter, Talos. Tell us, how young will she be when she does her first Brazilian jiu-jitsu class? <laughs> uh, with her, sometimes I, I have a, a small mat in, my, in my, my build here. And sometimes we go down and we, we practice a little bit, but he's, I think he's, he, her first martial arts class was uh, last year or one and a half a year ago, you know. Oh, I, so sometimes how, how I do it for her just to, just to say, she's five, almost wow. six. So July 29, she will be six, yeah. So wow. she's going to be a black belt just in for fun. couple of years, basically. Oh, maybe, <laughs> the first maybe, six-year-old just black for belt. fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just for fun. I don't. I I I I let her do what what she wants to do. She she's she, she now loves ballet. She wanted she wanna practice ballet, and uh, of course I wanna I wanna let she do it. She's she's four. She's like five years old, and she's already achieved more in her athletic career than me and Casper have in twenty something <laughs> years. Yeah, stuff <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she likes. She likes. <laughs> I I wish I had the choice between Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and ballet. Now, what's going back to your history? What's one sport that you just know good at, no matter how many times you've tried it? Ah oh, man, I think I think maybe surf. You know, I'm yeah. try, I'm, I try. I try sometimes, but. You know, I like I like surf, of course, but I'm not a good in surf and soccer too. Soccer, I'm terrible in soccer, man. Mm. <laughs> but I, I'm I'm big I'm, I'm a big terrible in soccer. I I don't know how to play soccer very well. Definitely, you, you're not you're not hanging in there with Jose Aldo, basically. When you guys are playing around, he, you're not beating him in soccer. No, definitely. He, <laughs> he he's good on soccer. He loves it, and he he used to play. Is soccer almost like a professional to me? Mm. It's just for fun with my friends sometimes, but you know, I'm um, definitely was the the last one to be picket. You know, <laughs> when the we were we were choosing the the team. Oh no! Now, now you know what you have more in common with us than I thought. Now, Hennen <laughs> Barrow versus T.J. Dillashaw. Give us the prediction for the rematch. How do you think Hennen does in this one? Barão will win this fight, or by points, or. Or Baron will, you know, TKO him at the, you know, uh, third the, the the third round for sure. In, in, this is my opinion. Or he will beat Dillashaw uh, by points, or TKO in the third round. There's the something about round. that third round. You love the third round, don't you tell us? <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's the, you know, is the is the almost the the half is between a little bit more than a half fight, but you know, a lot of things happen in the third round. Third round. I trust you. A million dollars in cash right now, boom, around the third round. No, no. <laughs> no? I don't have this money. Two million? I don't have... Let's, let's oh, bet no, no, one I'm dollar. Saying for us. Why not? I'm, I'm one saying for us. One dollar is better. <laughs> one dollar, sure. Well, that's more realistic to what we have. Yeah, now, of course. <laughs> second last question, Talos. You told us last time we spoke to you that when you fill out your pre-fight paperwork, you always put down some fake names so the Bruce Buffer reads them out of fight night. Some of those <laughs> names were Ugly and Shrek. Seeing as you'll yeah. be fighting in Scotland, is it safe to say the Bruce Buffer will be announcing you as Talus Shrek Ladies or Talus Groundskeeper Willie Ladies? 
It doesn't matter. Tal is ugly late. It's tal is like whatever. It's... It just, just, I, I don't care about it. My friends, my friends uh, used to, to call me uh, ugly because I, every time I call my friends, hey, hey, ugly, hey, ugly, hey, ugly. <laughs> I call everybody ugly. And yeah. they, um, all my friends call me ugly, you know, and my nickname, it's ugly. But well, I put it in the paper, but they never called me. I would like to see they call me a hey, Talis Ugly Lates or Talis Shrek Lates or whatever they want to call me, you know, just to get a, just to have a nickname. It's, just, yeah. it's fun. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a hell of a nickname. And now finally, Talis, give us the official prediction. You mentioned uh, previously in, t in the interview, but we want to get the detailed prediction from you. How are you beating Michael Bisping at UFC Fight Night 72? Is it going to be the third round? It's going to be by knockout or submission. Depends how we, how we receive my hands, you know, but I will put my hand on his face for sure. Any what, you, what, what, what round are you feeling? Is it the third round as well? Uh, maybe the first or second. Ooh, I don't know. Who knows? I will fight for I will fight for it. For you will see, like Team Bolt fight, I fought forward. I will fight for it with Bisping. Alrighty, all right, awesome. Well, UFC Scotland or UFC Fight Night seventy two in Glasgow, Scotland. Talus, ladies, you'll be fighting Michael Bisping July eighteenth. Guys, don't forget to follow Talus on Twitter at Talus Ladies. And uh, once again, it's a pleasure having you on Submission Radio. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you, guys. Thank you for the support. Thank you one more time to talk about myself uh, in uh, Australia. You know, thank you. Mm -hmm. I hope one day I can be there visiting your country. Thank you, guys. I appreciate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. El Wapo here. That means the pretty face. All you guys out there, you're listening to Submission Radio. Godspeed and party on. Boop, 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 boop. All right, guys. Our next guest is a 2000 Olympic silver medalist in freestyle wrestling and currently the number six ranked middleweight in the UFC. He'll be taking on Leona Machida at the Ultimate Fighter Brazil 4 finale on June 27th. And he is here via his translator, Heber. Guys, welcome to uh, Submission Radio. How are you going? How are you, sir? How are you? Good, good. I should probably. Uh, um, um, hello, hello. I'm uh, I'm fine. Um, I'm training very hard. Thank you so much. Hey, it's great to have you on the show, Yoel Romero. I'm not sure if I actually mentioned. Yoel, let's get right into it. You were scheduled to fight Jacare Souza on two separate occasions. Both times the fight fell through due to injuries and illnesses. How relieved are you to finally have another fight set up and for it to be, you know, just a month away or less than a month away? Me dice Joel que como te siente que, que yo a, estaba supuesto a pelear contra Jacaré y ahora tan tan rápido ya después de, de un ya después de un mes o dos meses ya vas a tener otro oponente machira sobre cómo te siente que ya tienes una pelea tan rápida bueno eh, lo que sucedió fue que en, en tres ocasiones se cayó la pelea con Jacaré la primera él tuvo neumonía o algo así la segunda fue el que tuvo la, la, la lesión de la rodilla y ahora en una tercera ocasión se iba a dar la pelea, pero creo que él iba a tener otra vez una, una cirugía y por eso se cayó la pelea por tercera vez. Y ya yo me había recuperado de, de mi lesión, gracias al señor, y eh, si me da la posibilidad, me dice, yo si sí me llama, que si cojo la pelea con Machia, pues creo que sí. Y le dijimos que sí y, y por eso es que vamos a um, he's, Joel says that um, that uh, he's feeling great. Um, that uh, that the first time that they were scheduled to fight, uh, Jack Ray uh, pulled out because he was injured. Mm -hmm. And he says the second time they were supposed to fight, um, Joel pulled out because he got injured. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last time, actually, Joel's the one that got injured. The second time, um, Jack Ray got injured. Because he had the pneumonia, mm. so he says that it hasn't been, I guess, the right timing or anything. But he says, uh, thanks to God, that now he has an opponent ahead of him, and uh, he's been training hard for this new opponent. And that uh, the UFC called him and asked him if he wanted to fight uh, Machida, and he accepted uh, the fight offer. Yeah, no, absolutely. Now, speaking of training for Machida, how is training going so far? And what has he specifically been working on in camp? We know there's a lot of talented guys at American Top Team, but did he bring in any karate experts to help prepare for Leota Machida? Eh, dice que, que cómo te va el, el campamento y que qué estás entrenando para este campamento y si tú has traído alguien 
eh, un peleador eh, en tu campamento que sa eh, sabe pelear eh, en, haciendo karate? Bueno, pues eh, he tenido primeramente que ser flexible en el pensamiento, eh, eh, tomarlo lo más ligero posible, eh, no, no, no tratar de bloquearme en, en, en cuanto a la a la que las oportunidades que se habían caído la, sobre la pelea de Yacaré, y al tomar esta pelea, la tomo de la misma forma que la tomé cuando tomé la pelea con Yacaré. Sí, es que, que ya eh, Loto es un, un peleador muy diestro eh, y, que, y que sabe pelear eh, a su mano de fruta y que es muy, muy escurridizo y que viene del karate. Pero eh, en todos los chines, no, no he tenido que traer a nadie, gracias a Dios. Eh, eh, en todos los chines hay personas que... que que casi siempre vienen de, de, un, de un mismo estilo, y yo gozo de ese, de ese, de ese privilegio, que en mi club hay personas que, que podrían invitarlo bien a él, aunque no me he enfocado, en que voy a ser sincero, no me, no, no me, me he preparado para el debate, pero no, no con el mismo enfoque, sigo enfocándome en mí, en, en tratar de mejorar yo mi estilo, en mi, okay. en mi carrera. Ok, um, he says that, um, that he has been trained, uh... He's been training for Machida, of course, and that when he trains, he doesn't train like uh, specifically on on let's say Machida, since his, his upcoming fight is against Machida, that he um that he he just likes to train at his uh at his, with his own style, and that he doesn't have like one uh, specific um uh, training partner. That he's uh, lucky enough to have a um, training partners that imitate uh, Machida's style. So that he hasn't had to bring anybody into the camp for his for this camp because he, he's he's fortunate enough to have uh, people that imitate him and that train with him that could imitate and have karate uh, karate backgrounds for this camp. But he says that mostly he focuses on himself and on his training. That he doesn't really worry about the opponents. Sure. Now, we know that this matchup is your typical wrestler versus striker fight. Lyoto is obviously one of the best strikers in the division, and Yoel is one of the best, if not the best, wrestlers in the division. You know, you, my question would be, Luke Rockhold obviously put on an extremely dominant performance against Lyoto Machida by taking him down on the ground and beating him there. You know, will, will Yoel be looking to test your striking skills against Lyoto, or will you look to dominate him on the ground, much like a Luke Rockhold? Eh, dice que cuando Luke uh, Rockhold eh, peleó contra Machida, que Machida, I mean, que, que Rockhold eh, lo, lo, lo tumbó por piso y que lo peleó en el, eh, llevó la pelea al piso. Que si tú vas a, a querer, eh, cuando peleas contra Machida, quedarte parado o llevarlo por piso, porque dice que Machida es uno de los, de los mejores eh, strikers en la división y que tú eres el mejor de luchando. Eso dice que que para esta pelea que vas a hacer si vas a para, quedarte parado o si so, te, te vas a, a luchar y llevarlo para pa el piso mira yo no tengo ningún problema en quedarme parado peleando con Machida créeme porque eh, me he estado preparando no solamente ahora toda la carrera como que me estaba preparando en, en, en los distintos tipos de de, 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 de como que como jiu jitsu como karate también en el taekwondo ve y en el mutai y, y gracias a Dios y a mi equipo hemos estado trabajando muy bien parado o sea que con él no tengo ningún problema en quedarme parado si se da la pues, si que llegamos si se da la, la, la posibilidad y llegamos a que caemos en la lucha lucho con él si caemos en clean hago mutai si caemos en el piso voy a hacer jiu jitsu si nos quedamos parados lo mismo voy a hacer dos o voy a hacer también karate en eso no tengo ningún tipo de problema Okay. Uh, you also said that he doesn't have a problem and he has to stand up and strike with uh, Machida. He says that he's very, um, that his team is, uh, has been training everything. They've been training jiu-jitsu, karate, Muay Thai, and uh, standing up, boxing, and striking. That he says if, if, he, if he's in a clinch with uh, Machida, that he'll use his mo uh, Muay Thai. If he's on the ground, he'll use his wrestling and jiu-jitsu. And if he stays standing, that he'll use his boxing and his striking techniques that he's been uh, practicing with his team and that he's not really worried 
of, of outstanding with, with Machidi. He says that he's really confident in his stand-up game and that um, wherever the fight goes is where he is willing to take it. it doesn't really, he doesn't really have a specific option that he, he's looking to do. Mm. Very good. Now, there's been fights in the past where Yoel's looked amazing in the first two rounds and then slowed down a little bit in the third. Just wondering, has he been focusing his training uh, to consider the fact that this will be a five-round fight? And what has he been doing to sort of push himself to make sure he's ready for the five rounds? Dice él que en las últimas peleas tuya que en el primer y el segundo round te ves como un buen peleador y no te cansa. Es como un monstruo que pelea muy bien en el primero y el segundo round, pero en el tercer round te cansa. Y esta pelea ahora con Machira va a ser cinco rounds. ¿Qué tú estás haciendo o, o algo diferente o algo para, para, porque a lo mejor puedes pelear cinco rounds? O, ¿Qué vas a hacer? Bueno, si te han visto que, que eh, hasta ahora nada más eh, 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 yo he llegado a, a, a pelear tres rounds entre eh, eh, en, en, en tres peleas y, y, y las cuales las he eh, una sola no he terminado o sea que que el cansancio viene como cualquier otro que se puede cansar pero no es un cansancio que te va a quedar que, que te quedas completamente sin gas un cansancio normal porque yo terminé la pelea con Tavares y terminé la pelea muy bien ¿entiendes? con todo el físico sin estar cansado Tavares es un atleta que, 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 que todos conocen su currículo, mucho más joven que yo, y, y yo no, no terminé cansado, y es que lo cerramos. Ahora, siempre he sabido ya que en, en una etapa de, de mi carrera, yo mediante, iba a llegar a cinco rounds, pues yo he entrenado, ya yo he, ya yo he entrenado los cinco rounds, o sea que no me preocupa llegar a, a los cinco rounds. Ok, he says that he's not worried about um, going off five rounds, he says that, um, that he's been training, his, this, this training has been, uh, He's been training um, and working on on the fighting five rounds, and that um, that he says his his last couple of fights that he's been um, he's been a little tired, but he says that the other fight the other fighter has also been a little gassed in the third round. But he says that his last um, couple of fights he's been able to finish it in the third round. He's been tired, but he says he's 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 um he's more than enough capable of putting on a good performance and, and finishing the fight strong. Because I think in his last um, his last two or three fights, he has finished the opponents in the third round. You're absolutely you're absolutely right. UL does finish his opponents later on in the fights. Considering that um, considering the UL, you know, you've already trained twice for Jacare and invested the time in training camp, and now you'll be fighting an opponent with a completely different skill set in Lyoto Machida. Are you at all disappointed that you didn't get the chance to test yourself and show off your skills against Jacare? Dice él que cómo tú te sientes que has entrenado en dos campamentos y tan, has entrenado tanto para Jacaré, cómo te sientes que no no todavía no te has asfaltado y si te, sabes, después de todo el entrenamiento que hiciste para Jacaré, que cómo si, si vas a querer pelear contra él o cómo te sientes que no puedes pelear contra él y enseñar cómo tú, cómo eh, entrenaste y cómo fue el campamento contra Jacaré. Mm -hmm. Bueno, nada, ya le acabo de decir al principio de la, de la entrevista que uno tiene que, si el primer factor que debe tener como atleta o como persona en tu vida es ser flexible al pensar y si y, y, y tomar la vida lo más lo más relajado, lo más flexible que pueda para poder seguir hacia adelante, no poder no quedarte ahí estancado en los pensamientos porque si no, no pasa, ¿entiendes? Y eso es lo que he hecho con ayuda de mis entrenadores, con ayuda de mi familia de, 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 no sé si la pelea con Dakaré, pues bueno, ser flexible, no importa que se haya, se haya perdido el campamento, pero en realidad no se pierde porque vas, estás aprendiendo. Cada día que pasa y, y estás entrenando, esos días estás aprendiendo. ¿Entiendes? No son días perdidos. He says, yo says that, um, that it's unfortunate that he wasn't able to fight Yoel, well, but that, um, that, uh, that the training camps that he did, and then unfortunately he had to. Uh, the, the fight didn't go through, but he says well, every day that goes by, he's learning more and more of MMA. So he's like, it's not every day that goes by that, that he did two camps and and he didn't fight in either against Jackery. He says mm. that it's he has to be his mindset is flexible. He knows that maybe he the opponent gets injured or or he gets injured, so he knows that that in reality each year that goes by he's gonna get he's gonna keep getting better. 
in his training and his jiu-jitsu and his, his striking game and, and, and all aspects of the game is going to become and get better. So he said it's really that he, he, he's just open-minded. So he, he's, it's unfortunate that he didn't get to fight and show his skill against that Ray, but he says that he's just open-minded and that he's just looking forward to his uh, new opponent in Machida. Sí, y si la pelea, pues si la pelea nunca se da con Yacaré, pues nada, yo sigo hacia adelante, empujo a la meta. No no me voy a detener ahí, que pues, si no se dio la pelea con Yacaré, ni se dio nunca, pues bueno, no se dio nunca. Eh, son cosas que pasan, a veces que, que, que hay atletas que, que empiezan una carrera y nunca llegan a, a, a terminar esa carrera, o, o no se enfrentaron con tal equipo, se enfrentaron con tal, con tal atleta, yeah, he says that um he's uh it's like somebody uh, that starts a career and then they don't able they, they start a career and go to school and then they never get to work actually in that career because they don't get to he says he was singing for Jack Ray, but if he doesn't get to fight Jack Ray that he's it's it doesn't matter to him. You know, his goal is to be a UFC champion. Mm -hmm. But if he doesn't get to fight Jack Ray, it's not like a but of course, if he's in the way, he'll, he'll, if, if Dana wants him to fight Jack Ray, he'll fight Jack Ray. Mm. It just depends what the UFC wants. Yeah, well, it's an interesting uh, thing that he brings up because Yoel is on a five-fight win streak. Uh, does he think that if he had beaten Jack Ray originally, that he, he might have gotten the title shot already and may have been the guy that everybody would be talking about as opposed to Luke Rockhold or Jack Ray? Eh, dice él que tú estás ahora en, en, has ganado cinco peleas seguida, seguido, y que que tú piensas si le, si, si le hubieras ganado a Jacaré en la pelea que estaban supuestos a pelear, que si tú piensas que tú ibas a ser, eh, en vez de Luke Rockwood, si tú ibas a ser el, el próximo para pelear para el título. Mira, yo pensar en lo que sucedió, eh, eh, ya te digo, eso es como adelantarse al acontecimiento. Yo solamente me ajusto a lo que sucede en el momento eh, en, 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 en mi carrera. Si se hubiese dado la pelea y yo le hubiese ganado a Karen, pues bueno, ya se, hay, habría que ver cómo se terminó la pelea, ¿entiendes? Porque el Rubio terminó muy bien su pelea, ganó muy bien. Entonces eso quedaría en decisiones de, de Dana White y Lorenzo, ¿entiendes? Sí. Y, de, y, de, y de, de, de todo el alto mando de Dios, sí. O sea, no, 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 no estoy yo en la mente de ellos ni, ni en lo que pudiera haber sucedido. Claro. Um, you all said that uh, depending on how he would have he said if he would have beat Jack Ray, it probably would have been the way he um, he would have uh, won the fight. If he would have won by a stoppage or, or a submission, or it just it just depends on the way he would have the the fight would the outcome of the fight. That because he says that also Luke Rockwood did a uh, finish from a cheater. So mm. if he would have won and and Rockwood would have won, and it would have it still would have been up to Dana White to decide who was going to be next for the to fight for the for the championship belt. Mm -hmm. Now it looks like Ro Luke Rockhold is next against Chris Weidman. With a win over Machida, would uh, would you well possibly want to fight for the title immediately, or do you think he'll end up fighting Jacare instead, or, or does he not really care? Is he just sort of as long as he gets the title shot, it doesn't really matter to him? Yeah, dice que después de esta pelea, ya que Rocco va, ya anunciaron que Rocco va a pelear contra Chris Weidman. Eh, dice si ya si tú ganas esta próxima pelea que si tú tú eh, quisieras pelear para el título eh, después que Rocco eh, pelea contra Wyman o si si vas a que si te, te importa pelear a, con Jacaré o no te importa pero es que eh, eh, yo no sé por qué que eso es lo mismo ahora como si me dijeran la pregunta era, fue, la pregunta sería vas a pelear por el título o vas a pelear con Jacaré ¿A quién le importa más uno? Yo puedo por el título, porque pelear con Yacaré, no veo a Yacaré como, claro. como, un, como, si Yacaré será el que pierde el título, entonces, ¿qué preguntaría? ¿Vas a pelear con Yacaré y por el título que digo, voy a pelear ahí por el, en el título? Pero si yo tengo la opción de ir al título, ¿por qué tengo que pelear con Yacaré? Si, si, si yo no estuviera en la opción de ir por el título y tendría que pelear con Yacaré, peleo con Yacaré. Pero si ya yo paso, Esa, esa, esa opción de pelear con Yacaré me he ganado o, o Dana White cree de que yo soy merecedor de pelear por el título, pues bueno, ¿por qué? Es que no, no veo por qué tengo que pelear a Yacaré. Claro. He says that, um, that if he wins his next fight and, and the UFC decides that he, he, he should be up next to fight for the belt, 
that he he that he of course he would fight he rather fight for the for the for the belt that he would he wouldn't want to fight Jack Ray he would fight he because it's it's either title or fight Jack Ray he wants to fight to get the title because that's his goal mm. to be a UFC champion. But um, it just depends on Dana White. If Dana White doesn't have to fight Jack Ray and then you get your shot, then he'll do that. He can fight Jack Ray. It's not a problem. But if Dana White says, oh, fight for the championship belt, uh, he's going to take to fight for the championship belt instead of fighting Jack Ray. It just depends on what the UFC wants to do. But he, right. he's open to both options. Great. He's flexible. Now, we've got some fan questions here to round out the interview. Uh, we're just going to ask a couple. The first one comes from Red Hawks 100. He wants to know, seeing as Chris Weidman is the champion, what advantages does Yoel think he has over Weidman? What does he think Weidman's biggest weakness is? And does he think Chris Weidman is beatable at the moment? These are questions from fans, from fanatics. He said that Chris Weidman asked if he wants to ask Chris Weidman if Chris Weidman has advantages that que tú le ves que, le, que, que eres mejor en, eh, de Chris Weidman o, o que tú, eh, y si tú piensas que, que le puedes eh, si tú lo ves que Chris Weidman le puedas ganar Mira, Chris Weidman lo que le veo a Chris Weidman es que eh, ha hecho todo su, toda su pelea muy bien es merecedor de la victoria porque eh, aparte de que ganó eh, fue, tuvo más ímpetu o más deseo que su contrario y, y, y eso es de, de, de aplaudir ¿entiendes? ahora okay. eh, nunca me he creído no tengo no, no te, soy bien modesto al hablar de mí mismo creo que no veo que todos tenemos un 50 y 50 eh, cuando te llegas a un down to five o entre los 10 eh, todos tienen un 50 y 50 de ganar o de perder y creo que, 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 que claro que sí tiene su hueco como lo tenemos todos claro. los seres humanos nadie es invencible claro he um he also says that that uh, he believes that Chris Whiteman uh is beatable he says that everybody is beatable he says that nobody is invincible in the sport of MMA that um that he believes he will be a, if he were to fight Chris Whiteman it will be a 50-50 chance that he would have 50% chance of winning and so would Whiteman so he could go either way so he says that that um, he is beatable, but that everybody in the division is beatable. So, and he's, that he's very humble, and he says that Chris Whiteman is a great champion, and that he has, in his, in his past fights, that he, he, had, and he, he has had the will to win the fight and has had more will than the other opponents that he's been facing. So he respects Chris Whiteman as a champion, and uh, he, he, he applauds him for being such a great champion, and, and, um, but that he's, of course, he's beatable. Sure. Now, this next question comes from a uh, user Ninja Death Cult. His question is, who do you work the closest with at ATT, American Top Team, and who are your main training partners? Eh, dice que con quién tú eh, entrenas en ATT y cuáles son, que, de, con quién es el más cercano tuyo que tú entrenas en ATT y quiénes son tú los, los, entre, los partners de entrenamiento tuyo. Bueno, tengo, entreno mucho con Jorge Más Vidal, Jorge Más Vidal, Entiendo mucho con, con, con Hector Lomba. Eh, entreno con, con, también con, con Maya Lorena, es esa otra atleta que no es de, de USC, pero que me ha ayudado muchísimo. Mar, Mar es una atleta con, con cual yo me preparo mucho. Ok. He says that the main person he trains with on his camps and the, the main, the main uh, fighter he trains with out of ATT is um, George Masvidal. Mm -hmm. And that um, he also trains with Hector Lombard. Of course. And that um, he also trains with uh, Marcus Lorieta. Mm -hmm. He's not in uh, the UFC, but he's one of uh, his training partners also in, in his game. You guys still there? Yeah, we're here. Okay, okay cool. Cool. Just wanted to check. Just what, wasn't sure if it was cut out. Uh, the Reed has another question. This is one of the last questions because I know you well, obviously, uh, has training to go to in just a second. Uh, the Reed wants to know, how much boxing training have you done with your brother, Juan Pablo Hernandez, the IBF and Ring Magazine Cruiserweight Champion, and how much wrestling MMA training has he done with you? Any possibility he might cross over to MMA? Dice que tu, si, tu, si tu has entrenado el, el boxeo con tu hermano Joan, y si... Joan ha entrenado contigo la lucha. Eres campeón de, eres campeón de boxeo, y tú eres campeón de lucha. Se dice si han entrenado y si Joan 
eh, piensa en, eh, el, a lo mejor pelear en la MMA? No, no, absolutamente mi hermano no tiene nada que ver con, 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 con nada con mi compatán y con lucha, nada, y este hombre no, no es de decir bien las manos, no, no, no. Si he entrenado con mi hermano en el boxeo, eh, él nunca, él lo que ha hecho es jugar conmigo la lucha, pero entrenar lucha no, no ha sido su idea. Él es campeón mundial en, en, en boxeo y está muy bien ahí. Con, con, en su, con su vida, con, con lo que gana en, en, en bolseo, y no creo que, que, que tenga idea de pasar el chat. <laughs> he says that um, he has uh, uh, wrestled with, with his uh, brother Johan, mm -hmm. but that he's been like playing around, it hasn't been nothing serious, <laughs> and that he has boxed with his brother, and that uh, his brother has helped him out in, in boxing uh, when they have trained, but that, um, that he doesn't believe his brother. Um, is willing to uh, to uh, pass over <laughs> to, to MMA. That he's he's happy with his pay and he's happy uh, uh, being the the boxing champion. Sure, <laughs> and what a great boxing champion he is. Look, final fan question here. Speaking of wrestling, this one's from Flying Kimoraba. Um, against Derek Brunson, Derek landed a lot of takedowns on Yoel. Given his background in international Olympic wrestling, what does Yoel attribute that to? Eh, dice que cuando tú peleaste contra Derek Brunson, que, que él, te, él te cogió y te tiró mucho para el piso. ¿Por qué, eh, qué, ¿Por qué pasó eso y por qué? Mira, eh, eh, en primera, le voy a decir varias cosas que son fundamentales. Nosotros habíamos visto en el campamento de que Derek se cansaba, él sí terminaba muy mal los tercer rounds. Y, y el que ha practicado la lucha sabe de lo que le voy a decir ahora, cuando tú tiras y tiras a una persona, el que se cansa es el que tira. Y ese, es uno, ese fue uno de los planes que nosotros teníamos, ¿entiendes? Que, 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 y, y, él, y que, o sea, eh, hacerlo trabajar mucho a él. Y eso fue lo que pasó, ya era okay. el que él estaba muy cansado. Ok, eh, he says that when he was watching his videos, For, for the training camp for to fight against Derek Brunson, that he would see that he would get really tired in the third rounds. He mm -hmm. really gasped going into the third round. Mm -hmm. So he says that um, for that fight camp, they were practicing, um, they trained, because um, he says that people that, that people that wrestle know that when you go and you take somebody down for a takedown or you try to slam them down, that mm -hmm. that gets the person that's throwing him down, uh, uh, tired more tired than the person that's getting thrown. Mm -hmm. So he says that he trained that, that he wanted to, he actually wanted to be thrown because that's what he trained for. He, he was trained that he let, let him, let him throw your well a couple uh, takedowns three or four times and that he was going to get gassed out and then that's when your well was going to take over. He said that that was a game plan that they, him and his coaches, uh, did. Quizás, um, quizás, eh, eh. El objetivo no era que me llevara al piso, pero sí hacerlo trabajar. O sea, me okay. llevó al piso okay. porque yo iba hacia adelante, hacia adelante, pero solamente para que hacerlo trabajar. Y, okay. y, y quizás ahí me descuidé un poquito y sí me llegaba a lograr al piso porque queríamos que me, que hacerlo trabajar, pero que tampoco me, me dominara. Ya. Yo sé que él quería hacerlo trabajar. El objetivo no era para que él se quedara down but he says that he would he was wanted for him to make him work and that sometimes you all would let his guard down and then that Derek would get a take down on him. But that the objective wasn't to get taken down, it was to make him work. So in the third round or in the second round that he would tire Derek out and then go for the go for wow. the win. That's interesting. It's definitely not a game plan that you usually hear of. Uh, obviously, we know UL is about to start training, so we're going to let you go. Before we do that, just a quick prediction. Uh, well, this is the official one. How does you, what, What's UL's official prediction for the fight? Leota Machida, how's it finishing at him? Is he stopping him by knockout submission, and in what round? What, what's the prediction, the hypothetical? Eh, dice que, que, que nunca ha habido un game plan. Sorry, eso es un, un game plan eh, que no, no, no hace mucha gente. Eh, pero ahora dice ahora la próxima pregunta es que cuál es tu eh, predicción para esta pelea contra Machina cómo eh, va a terminar la pelea no, ¿Cómo? Eh, yo no puedo predecir las cosas de Dios ¿me entiendes? lo único que sé que yo va a ir en la pelea ¿me es lo único que le puedo decir no soy yo quien pueda decir eh, cómo va a terminar la pelea yo sé 
eh, eh, que va a dar todo, eh, eh, toda mi energía en la pelea, va a ser una gran pelea, es lo que sí le puedo decir. He says that he he's not the person to to do a prediction for for any fight. That he says that he leaves everything up to God. God is the one that that would uh, do the prediction for him, and that um that basically he he that he's gonna leave his whole heart, all his energy out on the cage that night. But that he doesn't he, he doesn't have a prediction. That he he just knows he's gonna give everything he has, and he's gonna first show the world that that um that he could be become the next UFC champion. All right, guys. Well, you can follow Yoel Romero at Yoel Romero MMA and check him out. Tough uh, Brazil finale, June 27th against him versus Lieta Machida. Thank you very much for the translation. Um, we really appreciate Thank the time. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Well, there you guys have it. And thank you again, Yoel. We will have a great day because Cass, I don't know about you, but I wasn't expecting much from UFC New Orleans and then this happens. It happens to be one of my favorite events of the year. Blew my mind, blew everybody's mind. I'm just I'm just gonna kick it off the bat for you. Before we even talk about this event and what we think of the fights, did you expect this kind of event from a fight night? No, I did not. Basically, the UFC, as everybody knows by now, they hold so many cards. There's pretty much one every weekend now. And a lot of them just fly under the radar. You know, you kind of set your expectations to low a little bit because, you, I don't know, I'm, I'm kind of sick of getting my expectations high and then fights don't live up to the expectations. Or, you know, just in general, there was a lot of fights that were good on paper. Um, not necessarily the biggest names, but there were some really fun matchups. But I just thought, ah, you know what? Who knows? I mean, with the, with UFC Poland cards and UFC Brazil cards, you know, squashing between good pay-per-views and decent cards, I just wasn't sure how this one would turn out. To be honest, it was like you get invited to a friend's house for a gathering and you go there and it ends up being like a crazy party, like Project X style. <laughs> I mean, there's something about New Orleans. I don't, I don't know if the UFC have gone to New Orleans before. Um, my girlfriend and I, we watch a lot of like, not cooking shows, but shows like Top Chef, where they go to New Orleans, and then there's a, a season they did there, and it's like, it just seems like a really cool kind of place. Um, I don't know that it's New Orleans that has Bourbon Street, but it just seems like a mad yeah, place. Yeah, I think it is. I think it is New Orleans. And I had the WrestleMania there, WrestleMania 30. Mm. It's a great event as well, great vibe as well. Definitely seems like it's a place where... There's just some kind of vibe and, and yeah. cool sort of special things happen. And they got the Mardi Gras over there, huge event there. It's just got a lot of really cool vibe, that jazz vibe. I think that vibe really like played through. I don't know what it is, but I felt the whole event to me seemed kind of like a party and not like, you know, go there, you know, get shit face, wake up with a really bad hangover. Like, I don't know. Just... And a fat chick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you wake up with a wow and you're like, dear God, how do I, how do I, you know, is, is the window on the third story or the second story? Can I jump out without breaking my legs? Yeah, this is yeah. more like a street party, kind of like a Mardi Gras, like, like a, fe like, you know, like a festival, like a music festival, um, except people aren't being carted out on stretches. Actually, they were because the UFC, but nevertheless, it was, it was an awesome vibe and it was an awesome card. And I mean, we counted what, seven first round finishes, uh, no decision. Honestly, it reminded me kind of like of UFC... Uh, Fight Night 55 in Sydney of last year where they had 11 finishes like every every fight was just quality except this one is more of a party feel I loved it absolutely loved it if you if you're one of those people who's like up oh, I'm gonna skip this card and, and whatnot and you know you kind of you feel like the product's too saturated my god go back and watch this this card because if you missed it you're missing out on a lot oh yeah absolutely and I mean just the personalities on this card mm. really made it I mean we're gonna talk about Ben Rothwell later but I was just laughing yeah. all the way through. People, I, I was, we were on Twitter on the submission uh, radio, Twitter submission AUS at submission AUS, and people were just having a ball on Twitter, laughing, joking. It was one of those things where the MMA community just came together, and it was another example of why I love you and me love the sport so much. It just brings all the fans together. You're up there, you're joking, talking about these amazing finishes. It feels like every fight just kept building that momentum until it just exploded. It was, it was, it was just a experience for all the senses in this one wow i like that experience for all the senses to me it was like the closest you know in the simpsons where they have that like uh that vision of like the hippies and everybody like you know holding hands around a rainbow it was like yep. the ufc community's version of that everybody was just in this awesome mood I don't, I don't have any better way words to describe it but i don't know there was just happiness through the air you mentioned personalities i want to start 
our breakdown of the card, talking about a personality, Brian Ebersol, he versed Amari Akhmedov in a fight that, even though he was the underdog, I still thought he would pull through and win. Amari is obviously a dangerous guy, you know, he finishes guys in the first round, he's got a lot of power, he's a strong guy, and he's obviously a Samba expert, but Brian Ebersol, you know, he's just one of those veterans, he's seen it all, and he finds ways to beat guys that you almost expect him not to. You know, even going through to his uh, debut in the UFC against Chris Lydell, I mean, just put on a clinic, just destroyed, embarrassed Lydell, and even in his last fight, going up against John Howard, who, you know, has really good Muay Thai, and uh, again, an another guy that he beat. So I just thought, look, Brian Ebersol edged this one out. Didn't happen at all. It was basically over before it started. Injured his knee. Uh, I believe he said he twisted it. He threw in the, the towel, so to speak. Not literally, but he basically didn't he didn't answer the bell at the second round. Told his corner straight away. As soon as he sat down, you know, you see him, whatever, bending that knee, giving it a stretch, and the camera guys were right on that knee, and you kind of think like, what's going on here? And then he told the, the you know, his his corner straight away, I'm done, I'm I'm out of here. And it was something that you don't see very often. It was kind of hard to, what, what's the word I'm looking for? It, it almost didn't set in. You know what I mean? Because you just don't see that very often. What were your thoughts about Brian Ebersol and the way he went out? Well, you know, it, you, you you said it very well, Cass. It was, it was sort of hard to fathom the fact that he was pulling out. And when he was sort of grabbing his knee in the corner and putting it back and forth, I wasn't exactly sure what he meant until the fight was called off. But that's the thing. That's why he's such a special guy. He's an incredibly intelligent fighter. And, I mean, having 70 fights, he have to be really intelligent to be able to have that many fights and be able to do what he's done. Um I was extremely disappointed. I'm not going to lie because I love Brian. I love watching him fight. I was extremely excited to see if he could get a win so they could possibly fight in Melbourne in November. But at the same time, a part of me was happy that he didn't go out there with a twisted knee. You know, he's only 34 years old. It's hard to believe wow. he's only 34 years old, but 70 fights in and he does not look like he's... 34 years old he looks a lot older and you know it's not us trying to be um you know disrespectful it's just you can tell his body's really taken a lot a lot of a big toll from all his wrestling days i mean he's wrestled for a really really long time and his mma days so i was happy to see that he didn't go out there injured and sort of risk getting something more serious it's good to see him retire and uh, not get any serious injuries he doesn't need to get ex incredibly exciting fighter Unfortunately, we didn't get to see him at his prime. By the time he got into the UFC, um, when he got put into the last second against Chris, he was already quite old and had a lot, of, a lot of fights under his belt. So I wish we got to see him in his prime in the UFC, but I'm so grateful for the fights that we got to see from him. Yeah, I'm going to disagree on him looking old, though. I mean, maybe f he, he doesn't really have a flashy physique. He's never had one. But in terms of his actual look, like, you look at his face, I don't think he looks that old. I mean, he's got young eyes, those those eyes. He could be in Hollywood <laughs> with eyes like that. But, yeah, I, I'm going to say, honestly, I was really, really, really disappointed. And I, I say that in a very selfish way. I'm not saying it to be mean to Brian Ebersole or anything like that. But to me, he was a fun fighter. He was a guy that, even though he was a wrestler, it was always fun watching him figure out his opponents. It, it, uh, like, to me, it, he wasn't a powerhouse. He wasn't the quickest. He wasn't a crazy good striker with knockout power. He wasn't even the best wrestler. But he always found a way to win. And to me, I've always found that really intriguing. So... Even though, even if he was going to stay sort of a little bit low on the cards and fight on the prelims and maybe eventually build up a some kind of streak and then open up cards, to me, it was he was always a guy that I looked forward to seeing. So, considering that he's fought so many guys, like you know Stephen Bonner and Hector Lombard, to to mention a few, and obviously say you know Chris Lytle, for him to have his seventieth fight and just bow out like this, like just so nonchalant no, no so nonchalantly it was almost like such a non-event i watched the interview with uh, john morgan and ma junkie afterwards where he was eating and cooking and talking about it he's a very sort of dry humor kind of guy he's he's very humble he's not the kind of guy who's like look at me give me attention and i think it was almost uncomfortable for him to talk about himself and retiring and i don't really think he necessarily wanted the spotlight on him about it and just wanted to sort of play it off like oh look it's no big deal but you know, you, you really feel for the guy. So in, in a selfish way, it sucks. I'm disappointed that that's the last we see of Brian Ebersol. And uh, it's a shame because for a guy who's fought, been fighting for so long, and now finally he's in the UFC and finally the UFC gets a chance to be in Melbourne, obviously November 15th, the big stadium show, wherever they choose to be. And he doesn't get to be a part of that after spending so much time in here and, you know, being a part of, of you know, the, the Aussie MMA scene and, you know, fighting on, on Aussie cards. It's just a really big shame that he doesn't get to fight on the biggest stage of them 
more in what a lot of people would consider and I think he would consider his hometown. So, you know, but all that aside, I guess it's good that he's going to move on in life. And, and I guess, look, one thing about Brian Ebersole, he's always been known as a smart fighter. And I guess this is almost like the epitome of Brian Ebersole being a smart fighter because he's not going to gut it out like, say, you know, Chris Lieben or other guys like that who will just take years off their lives. I guess he's smart enough to just move on with his life. And, you know, he's already said that he wants to be a coach. Yeah, I mean, he's been a coach for a while, and it almost feels like he's already transitioned over to being more of a full-time coach than a full-time fighter for a while now. Mm. So I feel like he's already come to terms with his retirement. I mean, he mentioned that his knee was bothering him in the training camp all the way leading into this fight, and I guess as soon as he realized he wasn't going to get onto that Melbourne card, he, he thought, all right, well, might as well finish it now instead of going on through these injuries and possibly looking even worse in my next fight. So... Look, it's it's got the awesome thing is, and I think um, you know John, John Anik and Brian Stan said it best. He's over there at Tiger Muay Thai, um, working with a lot of young fighters. He's got a lot of great talent over there, so he's going to be a still a big part of the MMA game and very local here to Australia. So a lot of Australians, um, they should definitely go over there and train with him. I've heard nothing but good things from him, and he's down here in Melbourne quite a lot as well, doing a lot of seminars and stuff. So definitely pick his brain if you get a chance to. He's a very very intelligent guy. If you want to learn even more than all of those things combined, you can just check out our interview with Brian Ebersole. We had him on a few months ago. I believe it was last year. You know how it is. Dennis and I don't believe in cheap plugs, but there you go. Uh, check out the Brian Ebersole interview. And uh, I just got to say, this is why I'm not married, man, because Brian Ebersole got married and then, boom, retire. Coincidence? I think not. I'm not These married. These women, man, they keep dragging me down. The other day, I wanted to wear a black T-shirt out. The girlfriend says... Wear white. I just didn't go out. I Preach. Wanna, I'm not messing around with this thing. Hallelujah. Man, take me to church. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, good, good for Brian. Hey, look, at least he's married. You know what I mean? Imagine, imagine like, finishing off your career. I mean, I, I don't imagine the Brian episode would be, like, a millionaire off of this. And then imagine that. Like, y- you're sitting in, like, a one-bedroom apartment near the train tracks eating cans of tuna and an apple with a knife. Yeah, that's it. As long as a monkey that doesn't rob him in Thailand like it did to uh, Mike, Mike Swick, Swick. Yeah. everything should be fine. I mean, he's over there in Thailand. He's living it, living it up. It's a, it's a lovely, beautiful country. He's switching up the um, the MMA world in Thailand with AKA Thailand as well, doing that as well. So he's he's got a really pivotal role in MMA right now. I'm expecting to see some big things come out of there in the next 10, 20 years. Um, actually, Thai dudes being able to do grappling, a lot of really talented guys coming through mm. his camp. So it's going to be really interesting to see what he does after this it's hard to feel sorry for a guy that spent so much time in thailand i was looking for the segue and you said switched up so i'm just going to use that speaking of switching up <laughs> sean jordan and Derek lewis yeah uh jesus christ uh hook kick to the face Jesus. from sean jordan i mean he, he what- took he took away Derek lewis's smile with that one <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey. Derek Lewis lost his smile. Hey, a Shawn Michaels joke. That was brilliant. That was good. That was good. Took me a second. I like that. I I, I rate that. You remember when uh, Levar Johnson and Pat Barry fought, and Levar Johnson sort of had Pat Barry against the cage, and Pat Barry went for like this. You know, Pat Barry being a short guy and Levar obviously being a lot taller, and Pat Barry went for this like kick from really close range, and it was it was almost like funny to look at. I feel like. Sean Jordan kind of did a similar thing just because, like, it's almost comical how short and, like, broad he is. He's like a fire hydrant or, like, a tree stump. And you got Derek Lewis who, I mean, he's not, like, he's not lean and mean. He's not a bean pole, but he's he's tall. He's, what, like, 6'3", 6'4". Yeah. And for Sean Jordan to essentially throw the sweet chin music, the super kick, land it, I mean, Jesus. And not only that, but both guys were throwing a lot of kicks. Derek Lewis was throwing, like combinations of kicks you'd think Derek Lewis switched to being a taekwondo fighter this this fight was full of surprises yeah it was Cass I'll tell you something it was a really great fight to watch Sean Jordan's looking looked great since he's left Jackson Winkle Johnny's at a new camp the last few fights and he's been doing really really well I was just a bit disappointed with Derek Lewis you know he had some great moments on the feet and then he goes to attempt to take down on Sean Jordan big mistake Derek Keep the space, keep your distance, and stay standing. You had so much success. Obviously, when he went for that takedown on Sean, Sean's the experienced grappler, reversed it, ended up on top of him in side control. It's those moments, it's moments like that, especially in heavyweight, that really affect the fight. Um, I'm just super impressed at Sean Jordan's athleticism. I think a lot of people look at his physique and don't realize that this guy is a super athlete. I was Listening to what the commentators are talking about, some of the records he set at the LSU weight room, how about 610 pounds for a bench press cast? Not too shabby at all. I could do that. I just don't want to. 
<laughs> <laughs> now nah, that's that's impressive i mean he's a he's a super strong guy i still have memories of chet congo putting him up against the cage and him not being able to do much but the dude's evolving who knows man sometimes you get guys like uh I don't know, even like a Mitrion, it took him a while to really express himself in the cage. And even Arlovsky, I mean, he obviously turned mm. his career down. So I'm excited. You know, there was a point where I wasn't even sure if Sean Jordan was in the UFC. I just feel like, I don't know whether he was buried on prelims or we just didn't see much of him for a while or he just wasn't being pushed. But I, I really didn't know if, I thought he was like, um, I, th- he was, I thought he was like another Christian Moorcraft where he kind of came in, he had a couple of cool performances and then out you go. But man, he's w- with, with his improved grappling and, you know, throwing kicks like that, he's he's a threat in this division. I can't believe Christian Moorcraft's not in the UFC, man. Is he the guy with the uh, word art type tattoo on, <laughs> on his, on his uh, stomach? Yeah, um, yeah, man, yeah. He, he was awesome. Remember the slow-mo punches that he did? Uh, he was a great guy. But yeah, look, Sean Jordan, He's that's this is his third straight win. And yeah, like you mentioned, not that long ago, he looked like he was going to be released by the UFC. In the heavyweight division, there's not very many heavyweights, so a few more wins, and we can see him right up there back in the action. So huge, huge win for Jordan, and um, he he took a lot of punishment. I mean, he got a big cut on his face, he got a lot of punches to the face, and he has a very strategic game where he uses his wrestling and mixes it up, mixes it up nicely with the striking. So uh, kudos to Jordan for this one. The way the division is, I think if Sean Jordan wins one more fight, he will uh, he will be the next contender for baddest man on the planet. It, it, <laughs> yes. It'll be like, <laughs> Sean Jordan, could he be the baddest man on the planet? Polls say 90% probably, the way the, the division is. He, he will probably be the number one contender, if not the interim heavyweight champion. Instead of giving out bonuses to these guys, they should get um, Joe Rogan videos. So, like, you do really well in a fight, and they go, all right, man, we, we've run out of bonuses, but next fight, you're going to get a video of Joe Rogan talking about how you're the baddest man on the planet. <laughs> yeah. We're going to give you a countdown with Joe Rogan. All right, we're going to slot you in, so that would be awesome. I'd take that over a bonus any day. Yeah, yeah, fuck feeding your family. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's move on to the main card. Francisco Rivera versus Alex Caceres. Mm. Another case, 21 seconds, over before it started. Uh, Francisco really needed this fight after his performance against Uriah Faber and in saying that it was a good performance by him but obviously he lost due to the eye poke he went and tried to go to the commission they basically said nah not having any of it as you know normally happens Alex Caceres this this was on paper a really fun fight both of these guys they like to stand up they like to strike Uh, both of these guys definitely can implement their striking to their success I did pick Francisco Rivera to be to win this one and as we saw I was correct basically what what happened was Alex Caceres threw out a lazy jab, and that's what spelled the doom for Alex Caceres. Bruce Leroy, he threw out a lazy jab. He kind of left his hand out there. Francisco Rivera slipped it, hit him with a right, and then a crushing left, and then it was basically over. The I guess the only point of debate, really, in this one, Alex Caceres was uh, protesting, saying that it was an early stoppage. I'm going to get your opinion in a second, but I'll tell you mine first, and I don't think at all it was an early stoppage. If you watch... Sometimes the truth comes out in the slow motion replay, and I think this is another case of that. If you watch the fight, you can see Alex Caceres just completely out, and it wasn't until... It, like, he didn't actually turtle up. He was out of it, pretty much knocked out, and it wasn't until Francisco Rivera got pulled off him that Alex Caceres actually turtled up. So it seems to me like if he didn't get pulled off, he would have taken way, way, way more damage. What What do you think? I didn't, I didn't really check Twitter to see if there was any controversy about this one. What did you think? Early stoppage? Yeah, no, I don't think it was an early stoppage. And, you know, I love calling early early stoppage in fights. But I think Mm. what Alex needs to understand is just because in his mind he feels like he's all right doesn't mean the referee knows it. So you have to act like you're fine. And if you fall down on your back and you do what he did, I mean, you might feel like you're fresh as a daisy. But it's all about being able to convey it to the referee. That's the Mm. key. There's a lot of guys that get knocked out while they fight. They're fighting knocked out or they're fighting really really hurt but they got a good poker face and the fight continues so it's all about how you act and alex fell to his back and looked like he got seriously hurt so at the end of the day it's a rough one for him but nah give this one to rivera man it was a great finish sometimes i do a lot of thinking when i'm showering Mm, and i was in the shower and on the toilet yeah i think because you have like nothing else to do so you just a a lot of the submission radio twitter on the toilet and in the shower waterproof phones 
Yeah, I've, I've got a mirror opposite my... <laughs> yeah, you'd be surprised. I have a mirror, so it's even worse. I'm cutting promos. I'm, like, having nice. conversations that I should have nice. had earlier. I'm, like, <laughs> I've got comebacks from, like, a week ago. Like, ah, oh, that's what I should have said. But when I was in the shower, I was thinking to myself, like, it must be really hard to be in a fight and then whatever. You get dropped and you feel to yourself, like, I'm okay. I'm 100% okay. And let's mm-hmm. say you can see someone raining down with punches and before you know it, the fight is stopped. And you think like, dude, I remember everything that happened. I remember every punch. I remember everything. Like you had no right to call that fight off. And I wonder if like there's a lot of times, and I'm sure there is, where fighters feel like they're okay. And then they sit down at home or their camp or whatever. And then they rewatch the videos and they're like, Jesus, that's what happened. I, I don't remember any of that happening. Do you know what I mean? Oh, absolutely. And I mean, it's ex- extremely difficult because being able to convey it to a fighter in a way where it doesn't sort of seem like an insult but being Mm. fair to him i mean being in someone's camp it's got to be extremely difficult you and me aren't coaches but having to go to a fighter after a fight and go look this is what happened your performance wasn't the best you know this is what happened in the fight and having to really explain it to them so they understand it's it's all a big sort of ego shattering uh situation and i I imagine it'd be extremely difficult for the fighters to realize exactly what happened and the guys like Alex, who think, you know, I was fine and then rewatch that footage, the feeling that they get after rewatching it and being like, wow, everyone was right. I wasn't fine. I mean, that must be an extremely difficult feeling to go through. Yeah, that would suck. Either way, man, Francisco Rivera, um, he's he's looking to do big things in the Bantamweight division. I'm really curious where he goes next. Like we've mm. discussed recently on the show, uh, he was beating Uriah Faber up until the eye poke and then the, the bulldog choke happened. So I'm really excited, man. He could be a possible new contender. Let's talk about the next fight, Anthony Bierczak versus Joe Soto. I really thought Joe Soto was going to win. I thought, if anything, he'll grind out a decision. Not grind out, but, you know, win a decision. Mm. Couldn't have been more wrong. Minute 30 second, boom, it's all over. What did you think of this fight, Dennis? Absolutely impressed with Biercheck and the fact that he was able to have a controlled onslaught on Soto. Now, when I was watching it, I was very impressed with how much com- composure he has. He had when he was throwing those shots. A lot of the shots missed Soto, and I was uh, actually quite surprised when he dropped. I was trying to count out how many shots hit him but at the same time i was just very very impressed with anthony it was a great onslaught very very impressive impressive performance and i agree with you i had him losing this fight i thought so i was going to come in and beat him grind out a decision incredibly tough dude so that's a couple of tough losses for him first against tj dillashaw now against um anthony burchak interesting to see what happens with him but yeah very very impressed and a great great fight well, the interesting thing is TJ Dillashaw, he did it in five rounds. Mm. Anthony Bierczak did it in a, a minute and 37 seconds. Yeah. That's that's crazy. I mean, there's always like so many factors. Who knows? I mean, that that knockout after TJ Dillashaw, maybe Joe Soto wasn't uh, wasn't recovered. I mean, mm. I'm not I'm not trying to give excuses. I'm just saying. He really that- dropped, didn't he? Like after that onslaught, he fell to the ground with sort of his face out and his arms down. I feel like it was like a movie moment. Like if you yeah, put that, it was a, it was a you, game. It was a game. It was like a UFC game. You know, sometimes in the fight it just drops. Yeah, yeah, that's what it looked like. It was like a movie. It was like a picture perfect sort of like the body drops down, his face is out. It was it was quite scary to even look at. Speaking of that, that's what I felt when I saw Alex Caceres get hit with that big punch. You know when his fro was shaking. You know, in like fight night back in the day where you are yeah. fighting guys and like the hair physics weren't that right and they kind of look like rubber and you hit a guy with hair in his head and it kind of like, <laughs> like, that's what I felt when I saw this. But yeah, with Joe Soto, I, yeah, I, I get what you're saying with the game. To me, it's more like a movie where it's like, I don't know, small country town or like, you know, small rural town in like America, mm. like mm. MMA is all they do. And this is like the big day of the fight. And then like, I don't know, the poster boy gets like brutally knocked out. And then his body drops and it's like, it's all slow motion. The girlfriend's screaming, the mum's crying or whatever. But yeah, that was, that was like, I, I think that that was a really big highlight knockout. And it kind of went under the rug a little bit, like uh, under the radar. But that was crazy. Anthony Bierczak's, I guess, pressure and just overwhelming Joe Soto like that. Jeez, you got to feel bad for Joe Soto as well. Because when you lose to TJ Dillashaw, it's one thing. Okay, you lost to the bantamweight champ on... What was it? It was it was a ridiculous amount of uh, short notice. I think it wasn't in like twenty four hours or something. And then something crazy like that, yeah. Yeah, and then here you got you know full camp Anthony Beercheck and you get destroyed. Doesn't look good, you know, for the former champion. Yeah, that's right. And obviously, um, both of his losses are in the UFC as well. 
Mm. So he came into the UFC straight out of Tai Chi Pao's fights mm. to fill in, and now this is his second loss. So he'd be really looking to get a first win in the UFC in his next fight. I mean, two losses and not one win in the UFC just yet. And it doesn't it doesn't say much for the Bellator, you know, featherweight title, um, considering that Joe sort of got destroyed like that. But I guess that that was a different day. That was a while back. Let's move on to the featherweight actually division. Brian Ortega versus Thiago Tavares. I haven't checked who got the bonuses of the night. I don't know if you know, they, but I they got they got the uh, they fight got of it? the night bonus. Yep, they yeah. got the fight of the night bonus. Performances of the night. Dustin Poirier will have a chat about him soon, and uh, Sweet Chin Music himself, the heartbreaker, Sean Jordan. Sean Jordan or Sean Michaels? Which one is it? Um, now that's good. I'm glad Brian Ortega and Tava- Tiago Tavares got it. That was a crazy fight. That that um, had more twists and turns than Lombard Street. Uh, shout out to San Francisco. That was that was a crazy fight, man. Brian Ortega. Who knew his striking was so good? Um, for a guy whose BJJ is so good, I mean, his striking was amazing. That crazy sweep that he did off his back. I think it was an armbar or a triangle. I, th- I think one of them. I think an armbar. And then he swept Tiago Tavares, which you know Tiago Tavares. He's a good. He's a good BJJ black belt. Um, that was amazing. What did you think of the fight, Dennis? Yeah, well, you were talking about movies before. This was like a movie, had a bit of everything, absolutely wild. I'm, I'm on the same page with you, man. Ortega just absolutely blew me away in this one. Knew he could grapple, didn't realize he could take that much punishment, have so much heart, and be in there with a the striking. The fight was amazing. Huge scar into virus over the head. Um, obviously, kept growing bigger. I think this fight was one of the th- reasons why this card was as good as it was it really captured the fans everyone was going crazy in that third round and um if you look up fight of the night in the dick in the dictionary you're going to see a picture of these two faces next to it i mean uh stefan bonner and forrest griffin would be watching that fight nodding their head and approve an improvement it was just a great great fight really really enjoyed it and a huge win for ortega because Tavares is a super super tough guy and maybe some people would have stopped fighting if they were him with that kind of cut but he wanted to keep going so a lot of respect to him as well I'm trying to look, for, uh, as you're speaking, I was trying to look on the internet to see if there's any close-ups of that cut. I'm going to tell you something, or I'm, I'm going to share an opinion, and I, it's probably a lot of people that may disagree with me. Um, even though it was good to see Brian Ortega get the TKO, and uh, another awesome knockout to add to the collection of UFC Fight Night New Orleans, I actually thought the fight should have been stopped. And it's not something that I say very often, because, hey, I'm here to watch a fight. I'm, I mean... I don't want to see people get badly injured, but I kind of, I'm watching these fights as a fan. But to be honest, when I saw that cut um, and the doctor was like playing with it, it was like skin. It was like meat hanging off his face. And he's kind of like, you know, squeezing it together like, oh yeah, you know what? I squeeze it together. It, I mean, it, it, it swung wide open like a door, but yeah, that, that's okay. It, it looked like a huge cut. And I just thought like, what if he, what if he catches a punch the wrong way? And he just like rips half his face off. I know that's not. I'm not. I'm not sounding very eloquent. I'm sure yeah. doctors will be like, "Well, technically," I mean, it it was a big cut. And to be honest, I would have been very okay with the fight being stopped. And the way Tiago was fighting, especially for most of that third round, actually, he was extremely, extremely cautious. I don't know what was going through his head. Whether he was just like, "Dude, I want to, I want to leave this cage with my face intact." But if it was me, I would have stopped the fight. And I kind of wanted to see the fight stopped. Yeah, well, I mean, that's a very interesting opinion. I, I didn't get a chance to see a close uh, sort of picture of the of the, of the the scar, but I think you have a good point there. I mean, either way, both guys, I don't think there was a real loser in this fight. Both guys getting a lot of attention, mm. a lot of eyes on them. And um, who knows, man, this could be one of the best fights of the year. So it was a great, great fight. And I'm very excited to see what Otago does. Obviously, all wins, one no contest. So a very, very interesting guy. Let's see how old he is. He is only 24 years old. How about that? So, Ryan Ortega. Yeah. So another so, name to the, so add to much. the list of guys we're jealous of because they're younger than <laughs> us and more successful than us. <laughs> stupid young drunks. Yeah. These these kids with their with their stupid skills and soft skin and and glee in their eye casts. It just disappoints us with a couple with a couple of graying uh, greyhounds here. And, yeah. Uh, they're just they're just surpassing us in every single way possible. I know. At 25 and 26, we have the mentality of, like, grumpy old men. <laughs> yeah, I next know. Week, What's going to happen? Next week. We're, we're actually gonna... 40, 50, 60, man, 70. I don't know. Maybe we'll go full circle. 
Imagine, yeah, I know. Maybe we'll go Benjamin <laughs> Button and just be like really happy by then. Till then, we're sending soup back and complaining about, you know, hairs that don't exist in our soups. Let's talk about Dustin Poirier, Yancey Madero's. Man, another awesome fight. Uh, Yancey Madero is doing his best Frank Edgar imp- impression, taking mm-hmm. a whole bunch of punishment. And uh, I really wanted to see him go to that to the end of the first round because I was like, man, how cool would it be to see Yancey finish off the first round after taking so much damage? And he got he got caught. He got clipped pretty much straight away. One thing that I was really impressed with Dustin Poirier, obviously him coming from featherweight, and he's not really he's not a small guy as he clearly saw. Um, in, in terms of like muscle mass. But I guess the one thing that you always think about is the frame. Yancey Medeiros obviously having the much, much, much longer reach. But I was really impressed with Dustin Poirier's um, distance, the way he would gauge his distance, the way he would measure Yancey and the way he would fire off. Even when, whether he, he had him hurt or he didn't, man, the way he measured him was really impressive to me. What did you think of the fight, Dennis? Yeah, just an absolutely impressive performance from Dustin. Um, just shows that him moving up weight classes was the right thing to do. He feels he has the power and he showed it to us in his last couple of fights. With Yancey, he was overweight for this one. I think it was a catch weight fight at 159.5. Yeah. Um, so for people that don't know, he used to be a really, really big guy. He even fought at middleweight, maybe even higher. I believe we uh, heard an interview where he said he fought, at one point he weighed heaps. So a lot of people saying that the weight cut really, really took it out of him this time. Maybe it's a case where Yancey needs to have a look and See, like a lot of these guys, like Dustin, a lot of these guys moving up weight classes like Robert Whitaker, maybe that's what he needs to do. Maybe his body's just too drained to fight at this weight class. Well, just like Robert Whitaker, I'm going to be um, not suspicious. That's not the right word. But, you know, when Robert Whitaker moved up, I was kind of doubtful. I'm like, wow, he's not a big he's not a big guy. He's going to be a really small welterweight. And I'm kind of looking at Yancey the same way. The other thing is with Yancey, I mean, he's not known for his wrestling. So if he goes up to welterweight, he's probably going to be drowned in high level wrestlers. But I don't know. I'm hoping that maybe he can just fix his diet. But you know what though? You could be very right. Cause when you look at him, he's a really, really skinny guy. Mm. So it could be that he really is starving himself much like Dustin Poirier was. There's not, there's not much meat on the bone when it comes to Yancey Madeira's. I hope that he can stay at lightweight. Um, I think he's got some interesting tools. You know, he's uh, he's got that very long reach. He trains with the Diaz brothers. I hope that he stays at lightweight. But, man, what an impressive win for Dustin Poirier. And obviously here in his, uh, you know, it, it, is it his hometown? I, I know it's, like, close to his hometown. Yeah, it's somewhere around the vicinity. And uh, some people on Twitter are still not sure. You know, I was looking through a lot of people saying, well, he's beaten the guys that he's beaten, but we're not sure how he'll go against the top 10. i gotta be, I got to say, I'm sold on Dustin. I think he's going to be a big factor in the division in the future. He looks absolutely fantastic, and I think he could put up a good fight against a lot of people in the top 10. So I'm, I'm, I reckon the sky's the limit here, and I'm looking at Dustin as someone that could really shake up the division. Well, I think this is his signature win at lightweight because beating Carlos Diego Ferreira, a lot of a lot of people after that fight were like, "Yeah, it was good, but it was Carlos Carlos Ferreira. We don't really care." Yancy Medeiros, he's a guy that's been making waves in the lightweight division, and Poirier just absolutely creamed him, destroyed him. So for the moment, that's his signature win. And you know, John Anik, he got on the stick afterwards, and he was like, "It wasn't mm. like, oh." You know, I'm going to let you, whatever, give a shout out. It was like, I'm going to give you the microphone and I'm going to give you an opportunity to call out or say who you want to fight next. It was a not so subtle, like, come on, kid, like, call someone out. Come on. Mm. And uh, Dustin Poirier, (laughs) I felt like he was going to say Conor McGregor because in in my mind, that's probably the rematch that he wants. But obviously, you know, featherweight and just not going to happen in a million years. Um, so I don't know. I, I can't fault Dustin Poirier for it, but I, I do wish he called somebody out because I feel like that was his stage. And you could almost say that anyone who he would have called out, he probably would have gotten. Yeah, that's right. He, he looked very hesitant. Like he really wants to take that time off and almost like he was afraid to name a name because he wanted to be guaranteed to have some time off and not be put in a fight too soon or something like that. I got Maybe, a vibe yeah. like him like that from him he said he was banged up or whatever so that's fine go 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 relax but anytime you get the stick in your in your face especially after a win like that i reckon it's always an opportunity lost if you don't say something clever or something good or call out someone decent it's like an investment because i feel like if he does it in two weeks people will kind of forget like there's so many ufc cards like you just it's so easy to forget guys you have to be like in there in you know in the news boom and i feel like that's that's your perfect opportunity to secure that date 
you know, with the next guy. While, it, while you're white hot, while all the attention is on you, and, you know, for, for that 15 minutes, seconds, whatever, it, all, all everybody can think about. I mean, really, when Dustin Poirier won, as good as the Brian ortega Tiago Tavares fight was, not a single person was thinking about it or any other fight. So mm. it, it really highlights, you know, just how powerful that moment can be. Yeah, that's right. And, I mean, the next fight we're going to be talking about, Ben Rothwell, he showed us, you know, the importance of being able to say, say something interesting and have an interesting persona. I mean, I think everybody's going to be talking about him for at least the next week. So after a win like that, I absolutely agree with you, agree with you Cass. It is the moment to go on the stick, whether you feel like uh, you're banged up or not, whether it's a hassle or not. I think you figure out who you want to call out afterwards. And a good example of that is Sam Alvey, a guy that uh, called out Elias Theodore over, over there in Adelaide. Um, mm. Got a lot of media coverage, and I mean, Dustin would have gotten triple that. So, an opportunity lost for Dustin with this one. Yeah, I, I feel, and if I didn't make it clear enough, I feel like you know, there's a saying when you buy a car, it depreciates whatever, like I don't know, twenty mm. percent or X amount of thousand when you drive dollars. It out a lot, yeah, exactly. And I think your stock drops, you know, as soon as you know the fight night, you know, goes over because now the press conference is happening and what or whatever that's finished, and you know now now all the journos are writing about what to do next. But that that's the moment, that's the key before you drive off that lot. That's when you when you want to do it when you when your stock is is at the highest point. That's right. So hopefully he he knows more about buying cars than cutting uh, post fight promos. <laughs> but let's talk about the next fight, man. This is, oh man, this is this is the fight that Where made you the start? cut for me. I mean, exactly. There's so much to talk about. Ben Rothwell versus Matt Mitrione. Um, I mean, Ben Rothwell got that win over Overeem, and it seems like it happened ages ago. Overeem since then has become one of the top guys in the heavyweight division yet again. And mm. um, Rothwell's been injured, out of the action. Almost seemed like the man of of the town at that point, then sort of forgotten about. People sort of forgot about Ben Rothwell and moved on to what else was happening. So, um, yeah, now he's definitely back on the radar, Cass. What did you think of this uh, fight before it even happened? Did you give him much of a, sh of, much of a shot against Matt Mitrione? Mm, this is a tough one to call because Matt Mitrone, I I thought of Matt Mitrone first and it's pretty much what everyone says. He's obviously got knockout power. I think he's only had like, what, one decision fight. His fights end in a knockout or, oh, sorry, let's say finishes because then there was the Brennan Sharp fight where he got choked out. But essentially, Matt Mitrone's fights, they, they all finish. Uh, he's very quick on his feet. He's got knockout power. Uh, and then I thought, well, Ben Rothwell, you know, he hits really hard. Wouldn't necessarily say he has the head movement of a Matt Mitrione, but he has a fantastic chin. So I was like, I don't know, man. This this to me was a pick and fight. I, I, I really couldn't decide. I probably I was probably leaning more towards Matt Mitrione just because he's been on a you know shit hot run as of late, and I don't know. I don't know. Just seeing him being more athletic, I just kind of gave him the edge. Um, the it it all just kind of seemed pretty normal. Matt Mitrione came out. I think he's used that song like at least the last three <laughs> four times. Yep, cool, commentators talking, whatever, and then Ben Rothwell, his music <laughs> hits, right? And first of all, it sounds like something out of Star Wars. It's just, it's just I don't know, it's, it's not a song that anyone would listen to. This is more like a sample. This is like something that you go through, like, the records of, like, I don't know, what TV shows use for, for background music. And then you see Ben Rothwell standing there with the hoodie, and I was like, oh, man, oh, man, he, he, here we go. What, what, what's going on here? And, uh, you know, first thing I thought of was The Undertaker. Then I thought, I watched Star Wars recently. Then I thought Darth Sidious, Senator Palpatine. And I thought he was going to do something. I think I think what's funny is that he didn't really do much. He just kind of walked out and, and, like, gave everybody ample time for it to set in and then start forming their own opinions. Like, I thought, oh, maybe the music's going to kick in. Yes. And then he's going to, like, take off the in. rope. He was never just kicked in. He just, he, he he just like walked the whole time. Killer. It was, so it, was it was so awkward. It was so awkward. It was so awkward, so funny, so awesome. Um, the Law and Order serial killer music from SV <laughs> number, track number three was playing as he was walking down in his velvet robe. And I'll tell you something, unexpected, <laughs> totally unexpected. Mm. Didn't realize it was going to happen. And uh, it panned over to Matt Mitran at one point when he was walking in. And Mitrion was a bit like, what the hell is going on right now? I don't, I, I'd be interested to see what was going through his mind when he saw that. You know, you know what you they needed? funny or weird? Like, it would do something to you mentally, surely. You know what they needed when they panned over to Matt Mitrion? 
blue lights. They need the they need the octagon to be blue. Yeah, like Undertaker. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know how whenever the Undertaker enters, they'd always pan over to like whoever he's wrestling, and it you'd, they'd see the reaction, and they'd always be like nervous or scared or whatever, <laughs> or, or trying to put on like a brave face. I really wish they did that. But um, yeah, I remember at one point they showed Matt Mitra and he was just like laughing his ass off. It was it was it was so awesome. It was just golden. And I know the the you know anti WWE fans are just gonna hate it. There's gonna be the MMA purists are gonna be like, this is the biggest crock of shit. I don't want to see this in my sport, etc. Man, as awkward as it was, it was golden. It was hilarious. Yeah, absolutely. And I think what really sells it for me is that. Ben Rothwell, he's a cool guy, but he's not smooth. He's not like one yeah. of those smooth... Ca- he's not an ovarine, you know? He's not going to walk into a place and uh, all the guys look at him. Oh, I want to be like this guy. He's he's, he's, he's a bit awkward. And mm. he throws off the robe and then he puts his arm up and does that whole thing. And it's just, yeah. it's just, it's just hilariously awesome. At the same time, you know, this guy can mess anyone up. So he's legit. And it's, yeah. it's just it's just a crazy dynamic that I don't think anybody expected. Um, what? So, all right, the fight, the fight, the fight. Uh, Matt Mitrion, he landed some good punches. He had some good movement. Um, ben Rothwell was very stationary, very flat-footed. He used yeah. a strange defense where he put his elbow up to meet a lot of punches, but it left one side open. So Mitrion was able able to land land a lot of really good combinations i actually thought oh i don't know what's going to happen he landed some good body kicks on him as well which we saw over him obviously landed some crazy kicks on him too and then when it went to the ground and he got that guillotine front face lock type choke on him <laughs> matt mitrion tapped with both hands almost yeah like ben rothwell had some kind of superpower like he was <laughs> yeah. actually an evil jedi and i think that's what sort of helped the whole persona go even further with everybody else yeah, it was really funny. It was like Matt Mitrin was like super helpless, tapping with both hands, yes. like, ah, get me out of here. <laughs> and it's as if it wasn't funny enough that Ben Rothwell looked like, you know, a Jedi that turned to the dark side. He won with a choke. You know, you watch Star Wars, you see Darth Vader with a choke and, you know, holding mm. people in the air or whatever. Mm. And then he choked out Matt Mitrion. Um, you can't write this stuff, man. It was, it was, it was too much. It was too funny. And then the post fight, you know, promo where he just <laughs> no. wants to like say his thing fight. and then boom, <laughs> drop the mic and then walk out of there. And then John Attic's like, "Yeah, cool. Now that that's done, can I ask you some questions?" It was so bad. And he he wanted to stay in character, and he was just like, "Yeah, well, ah, well, oh, man, it, it, it was classic. It was so bad." Oh just, my god, it was so good, yeah. Just a few thoughts. Yeah, when I say bad, I mean it was fantastic. It was delicious. Um, when, with Ben Roth, thought, yeah, it was so weird. Like, the fight started, and then he just walked out, like, really solemnly. Like, are we touching gloves? Matt Mitra, and I, I think, didn't want to or whatever, didn't. It looked, again, another awkward moment with Ben Roth. And then he just, like, stood there, didn't move. And he, he Matt Mitra was, like, dancing around him, you know, throwing feints, whatever, threw a few punches. And, the, and Ben Rother wasn't moving. And then all of a sudden, it's like he just snapped into it. And then boom, came the sexy dancing out of nowhere. It was like, it was, it was so <laughs> hilarious. And then, yeah, obviously, can't, it, like when Matt Mitrone was landing the punches on him, I was like, shit, we may see Ben Rother get knocked out again. This could be, you know, the Arlovsky fight all over again. Because Ben Rother is not really the kind of guy that gets knocked out. I, I, I don't, I haven't really counted, but I think Ben, uh, sorry, Arlovsky may be the only one. Or I think Roy Nelson may have knocked him out as well. Um, or it could be the other way around. I don't know. I'm lost. But my point being, when I, when I was watching these combos land, I was like, oh man, he, he may actually knock him out. And then Mitrion, which I thought at the time was really smart, he went for a takedown. I was like, yeah, that's good. That's smart. He's obviously not expecting, he's obviously not expecting to take him down. And then Rothwell, uh, you know, in the scramble, locked up that choke and then boom, before you know it was over. So as funny and as goofy as a lot of this stuff was, it actually worked. It was really, really good. I know, and that's where you take a step back and you're like, wait a minute, now this is legit. And the choke, it didn't even look as much like a choke as it looked like he just grabbed his head and squeezed it. Mm. And it was just like, this guy is like super powered or something. Yeah. And um, yeah, he did. He lost to Andre Olovsky. He actually beat Roy Nelson in the IFL. But I was going to say, man, he after the fight, he said that he thinks that Stipe deserves the next title shot. And that he's know. that he's uh, interested in find, fighting Andre Olovsky next for the number one contendership. Well, so, I can definitely see why he'd want to verse Andre Olovsky. Get rid of that loss. Get rid of that loss. That's right. So hey, man, that makes great sense to me. I'd love to see it happen, and um, hopefully we get another chance to chat to him. But 
<laughs> I'll tell you what, it, it made the event for me. I was laughing about it long after the whole thing was over. Even when the Dan Henderson and Tim were walking into the ring for the main event, I was still thinking about it. And I was going through Twitter and everybody was still tweeting about it. So whatever it is, he's just got this personality where he's a lovable guy. You're not going to mm. dislike him. He's sort of a bit of a goof, but you're not going to dislike him because he's awesome. He's a great fighter. And he, yeah, he's just a lovable guy. I really see him as someone that could get over big with all the fans. And even though this was a fight night, I mean, man, I reckon this win did a lot for him. It was a big, big win, another huge win after this Obreem thing. And yeah, just a great, great moment. I mean, I hope they do get behind it because I will say the unfortunate thing is I heard a lot of boos and I think the people there were a bit miffed at the whole WWE aspect of it. So I hope that a lot of people do get behind Ben Roth. Or what, what did you see on Twitter? Were people positive about it? So a lot of positivity. Yeah, most media members loved it. But then again, good, you good. know, the, the fans... This is gonna. This is gonna be interesting. You bring up an interesting point. The whole WWE aspect of it, but I hope the the UFC embraces it because I mean he spoke about the politics. He didn't get a bonus um, for his fight, so hopefully the UFC aren't miffed at him and l let him do what he does. I hope they don't interfere with his persona. Gonna be honest, like there was a lot of people that had amazing fights that were definitely gonna miss out on bonuses. It's just, it's, it's like, you know, being a kid in a candy store. There was just too much good stuff. So, yeah, I mean, that sucks for Ben Rothel, but when you got Sweet Chin Music, Sean Jordan, you know, laying kicks to the face <laughs> like that, I mean, how can, you, how can you go past that? Let's talk about next fight, Dan Henderson, Tim Bosch, and then we're basically going to wrap it up. Um, again, another fight over before it started. What did you think of this one, Dennis? Well, I mean, I was one of those people that was saying that Dan Henderson should have retired um, before that yeah. DC fight. That was tough to watch. Mm. And um, in this fight, you know, he looked good. Uh, Tim Tim got hit by the H-bomb, you know, and that's the thing. He's really, really fast with that H-bomb and moving backwards. He can still hit people with it. And um, once he hit him, it was it was game over. I mean, I would have I was in the sort of ballpark with a lot of people where I would have liked him to retire there on that high note because I thought it was a re really, really cool moment. But at the same time, I've sort of thought about it. And I think, look, the guy's done so much for the sport. It really seems like he genuinely loves doing this. It's it's not just a job for him, and he doesn't just do it for money. He does it because he loves it. Um, you know, he can retire whenever the hell he damn wants to retire. So either way, I was just really, really happy uh, for Dan, and I thought it was a really, really good way to cap off the night because how, how crap would it have been if, it was some, if there was some drag out, five round sort of decision finish after a card like that? It was a perfect way to finish the night. Yeah, totally agree. Um, look, I think it was it was a great win for Dan Henderson. I mean, knock out, knocking out a guy like Tim Bosch, who's a really tough guy, you know, notoriously hard to put away, great chin, and that chin has really given him a lot of the success that he has had. Mm. A lot of his best wins mm. have been comeback wins. Um, and to just go in there and destroy this guy in, like, what, 28 seconds, that's huge, that's massive. Having said that, uh, you know, the commentators a lot a lot afterwards were saying that, oh, Dan Henderson proved this, he proved that, he proved he still got it. And I was thinking to myself, what exactly did he prove? I mean, he proved that he's not, you know, over the hill. I I'd still say he's past his prime. Um, you know, I was reading an article on Bleach Report the other day that was talking about how, you know, when Dan Henderson went on TRT, I think it was just before the Vandalay Silver fight, and all of Dan Henderson's biggest wins have come when he was on TRT. And then once he got off it, you know, then came all these horrible losses. And you look at his record, and I guess it, I guess you do have to mention that, you know, he he went on this good streak, you know, Babalu Sabral, uh, Cavalcante, or sort of Fajal, whatever, Fedor Menyanko, then Shogun, who, and then his losses were Lyoto Machida, ex-champ, Rashad Evans, ex-champ, Vito Bell for ex-champ, and, you know, on the, the streak of his life, beat Shogun in a fight that didn't look that great until he won. DC, I mean, champ. Uh, and then Gaga Musasi, who's just an absolute beast. So I guess you got to factor in that it's not like he had any easy fights, but he really didn't look good in, in any of those fights. Um, but to, to say that Dan Henderson proved something, I don't really think he proved anything. What, the, the, that he's got a hard right hand? What does that prove? We already knew that. That That's basically how Dan Henderson wins most of his fights nowadays. He circles, he waits, and he sort of, you know, bides his time, and he looks for that right hand to hit. So I don't really think he necessarily proved anything. I think if I think the the only thing that he proved was that Tim Boach couldn't go in there and just knock him out and destroy him and and I guess the only thing he proved that his his body is still with it. But then again, Tim it's not like Tim Boach really landed anything. Had Tim Boach gone in there 
And, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe if the fight dragged out any longer or maybe went to the, you know, first, second, third round, Tim Bosch may have gotten the knockout. Who knows? I don't think this fight really proved anything. I think Tim Bosch came in there. He sort of ran in. Dan Henderson dodged all the strikes. And then he hit the right, you know, the, the, the H-bomb, which we already know is going to knock you out if it connects. That's nothing new. And then you look at the top 10 of the middleweight division. You've got, you know, Bisping at number 10. They don't want to fight each other. Talos Lates, I don't know, man. Um... Yeah, I, th- I think that's a winnable fight for Hendo. Tim Kennedy, I don't think he'd beat Tim Kennedy. Gay Gal Musasi, we saw what happened. And then you got Yoel Romero, Anderson Silva, Leota Machida, Vitor Belfort, and Jacare Souza. I mean, I- oh, sorry, and Luke Rockhold and Chris Weidman, none of which are really very winnable fights for Dan Henderson. So I'm not saying Dan Henderson should retire. I'm just not necessarily jumping on this Dan Henderson train going, Hendo's back, you know, he's, he's back, and, and here he is. I think give him fun fights, give him those kind of showcase kind of style fights, fights that you know are going to be fun. And this Tim Birch matchup was a perfect fight in that. And, uh, you know, see if you can extend his career and, you know, help Dan Henderson make a bit more money before he inevitably retires, seeing as he is the oldest guy on the roster. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think this will be a bit of a retirement tour because if you get anybody mm. now in the octagon with them and they avoid that H-bomb, um, then Dan Henderson is in some real trouble. So um, interesting to see who they give him. I think he's got a couple of fights left, something like that. So, you know, why not use him as a sort of a headliner on a lot of these fight nights and uh, give him some more similar guys like Tim? and make sure those guys are in there to stand and sort of bang with them so he can land more hage bombs um in 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 that sense uh in that sense i'll I'll be happy but if they go back to the board and they go hey let's start trying to give them guys from the top 10 then i'll be like oh man i don't want to watch this well i was gonna say you know don't give him a guy like say yoel romero who's just going to out wrestle him or you know even tim kennedy who would just look to take him down but you know costa Filippo is ranked one above tim bosch he's at 12 tim bosch was 13 you gotta think uh actually i don't even uh i'm just having a look there dan henderson is unranked at middleweight uh you gotta think that puts him at number 13 at least uh, give him give him Costa Filippo. Costa Filippo needs a win. If he beats Dan Henderson, he's got a good name on his record. Um, and either way, I think that is somewhat of a winnable fight for for uh, Dan Henderson. Costa Filippo, after all the you know horrible failures he'd had, he's had recently, basically due to you know his lack of wrestling. He's not, you know, Dan Henderson's not going to look to take him down, and Costa Filippo is not going to look to take him down either. So mm. I think give him Costa Filippo. That, that's a fun fight. Costa being an ex-boxer, Dan Henderson looking to land that right. I think that's going to be a stand-up war. It could be good. Yeah, that's right. I know a lot of fans are calling for him to rematch Rampage Jackson, but I think what? because he's so light now, especially that he's off the TRT, yeah. it's just not really the fight to make, I don't think. But I, I wouldn't be interested. I'd be more interested in seeing him versus Vito Belfort. Yeah, oh, yeah. So he, has lost. You know, maybe a that lot. could be something fun. But yeah, I like I like this Costa Filippo fight, and yeah, good good on Dan for doing what he does. And I was I was listening to uh, Charles Sun and Randy Couture talk about a few uh, training stories with Dan Henderson, and uh, just talking about the fact that he was always the guy that would train the least, least hardest, sort of chill out more, and then not not really put much training in. Then he just go overseas and knock guys out. Or apparently, this one time he was in a wrestling competition. And he came back from a holiday or something like that, barely got any mat time and went in and won the whole thing. So wow. the guy's just a natural talent. There's no doubt about it. His athleticism and his genetics have given him um, an ability to do stuff that other people, other people can't. And that's probably one of the reasons why we don't want to see him fight You know, some of those top guys in the top 10 because at 44 years old, um, a lot of those natural abilities that he had before are now sort of going. So it'll, it'll be fun if they do this Costa Filippo fight. Yeah, at his age, he's a, he's able to do a lot of things that most people couldn't, such as pick up a really hot misses, which is what he Jesus, did. Jesus, yeah. My God. Yeah. Was, hats hats off to Dan Henderson. Yeah, very, very nice, Dan. You, you got to love the guy. The guy's just, um, he's done so much for the world of MMA. I'm happy to see um, he's sort of been, he's able to do sort of what he wants with his career near the tail end of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping that Dan Henderson will be one of those sort of storybook endings that you don't see all too often, much like we saw with Brian Ebersol, you know, on the same night. I'm hoping he'll be more like a Mark Munoz style retirement if and when that happens. You gotta think the day the, the fights and the days are really numbered for Dan Henderson. Man, I think that's enough yammering from us for another week. Thank you so much for listening, guys. We really appreciate it. A huge thank you to our guests, of course, Yo Romero, the always lovable coach Wink and Talis Lates. 
expect big things from all those guys. Uh, and a hu again, huge thank you for all those guys for coming out. And of course, Heber, Yoel Romero's translator. Now, I pretty much know the answer, but Dennis, I've got to ask any last words for the fans before we go. Yeah, just a couple of ones. I mean, we've got a, a couple of quick things to talk about. The first one, I'll quickly get this out of the way. I watched Aloha, which is the new movie with Bradley Cooper. Mm -hmm. um, it got 32% on Rotten Tomatoes. A lot of people saying a big, a big miss has Bill Murray in it, a lot of other great actors. Um, have to say Emma Stone's in, in it, I believe. Rachel McAdams, yeah. Rachel McAdams is in there as well. So mm. a lot of great actors, I have to say. Um, not the best movie, a, a, a big miss uh, from uh, the point of the script, but I'll have to give it a bit of a higher rating than Rotten Tomatoes. I really would give it more of a 50% rating, sort of two, two and a half stars. Still enjoyable. Bradley Cooper mm. still manages to hold it together but Cass speaking about movies the submission radio crew we went we watched Entourage first night that it was out um you me for people who don't realize huge Entourage fans um watch the season through and through over and over again always compare uh, sort of moments to our submission radio career and moments in our life to the show you can always go back and look at moments in the show and be like oh yeah I just had a Johnny drama moment or I just had a turtle moment so um in saying that what did you think of the movie um, I feel like there's nothing that could have really prepared me to, for this review because I've been waiting to see this movie for so long. Um, I, okay. So I think it was a good movie. I thought it was fun. I know that before I kind of went in there expecting not much, right? Because this movie has been like the movie that I've been wanting to see since the series went off air, right? I've been craving more entourage. And then I was like so excited when they announced we're finally going to make the movie. You know, they had those holdups with the money. And I was like, oh, yes, it's happening. And then leading up to it, I was like, you know what? should probably set my, you know, set my expectations to low. And I know you let slip that, you know, I didn't really get the best of ratings. So I was like, yeah, this may actually be a pretty crappy movie. Well, I enjoyed it, man. It was like a long episode of Entourage. My biggest question was how are they going to fit in what they normally do, you know, over the course of, I don't know, what, four hours? No, even more, like 10 hours, 12 hours, which is the, the, the length of an average season, I think. They do, I don't even remember whether they had half an hour or one hour episodes, but how are they going to do that and fit in all these storylines into like, what, an hour and a half, two hours? And I think they did it pretty well. The, the plot was pretty simple. Oh, and I'm going to tell you now, spoilers. Right, I don't even know what I'm going to say here, but if you if you are planning on seeing the movie, you don't want spoilers, maybe mute for like the next two minutes or so, three minutes. Um, but I thought the plot was really simple. Um, there wasn't anything too crazy. And what I liked about the movie, I don't like when movies do like sequels or whatever, make big movies out of TV shows, and they really try and progress all the characters. And it's like, oh, you know, we're gonna we're gonna split them up, and they're gonna start arguing, and then you know, by the end of the movie, they're all gonna get back together, and they're gonna learn something. They're all gonna go on these you know personal journeys. I wasn't interested in that. I just wanted to see more Entourage. You know, the guys they live in Hollywood. Vince is a good-looking guy. He bangs girls. Johnny Drama is you know. Kind of like the red-headed stepchild, turtle is turtle, and E is E. I just wanted to see more of that, and that's pretty much what you get in this movie. Um, you know, the jokes were still good. It was written well. Uh, I was very curious to see what the intro was going to be like. I like the intro. You know, obviously, we've been watching Entourage for so many years, and you see that same intro with um, Dave Navarra's uh, band. I can't remember what they're called, and, you know, they do the intro music. Me and Dennis were talking about it, like, how, how are they going to intro this movie? I don't think you'll be disappointed. It was pretty well done. Uh, lots of tits, lots of ass. The usual stuff. Um, again, spoiler, pretty much everyone's single in this movie. So I don't think this movie would have worked if obviously E's married, Vince is married, you know, everyone's successful. I, th I thought it really worked. The only thing I know a lot of people have been saying is oh, it kind of ended abruptly. I would agree, but I kind of feel like, dude, this movie could have been five hours and I still wouldn't have had enough of Entourage. I do feel like, you know, there was a problem. They solved it. They overcame it. And then it was kind of like, well, that's the end of the movie. There, there probably could have been an extra maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes in there. But other than that, solid. I thought it was a good movie. What about you, Dennis? What about star rating? So let's get the star rating out of you quickly before I quickly wrap this thing up with my entourage thing. I feel like I feel like a fighter when, when you ask for predictions. I hate these star ratings. I, I would give Entourage, honestly, three and a half stars. No. Just If we're talking all movies in general, because there are much better movies, obviously, but... It, it didn't disappoint. Three and a half stars. Between three and three and a half stars. What about you? Some some great points made there, Cass, and a pretty good rating there. Look, I think you pretty much covered it in what you said. Doug Allen really sort of needed to focus on the part where the problem gets solved and add another 15, 20 minutes to the movie. I think it would have uh, made the movie a bit better. Uh, Rotten Tomatoes gives it 30%. I have to disagree. I think that's wow, a pretty that's low all. rating. 
Um, I'll, I'll, I'll give it like this. I'll give it two and a half stars for people that aren't Entourage fans and haven't watched the show previously. You probably won't enjoy it as much. And I'll give it three stars to the people that have watched Entourage. At the end of the day, guys, Entourage is, on, is Entourage. It's like bad pizza. It can never truly be bad. And what I'm really looking for is if these guys can bring back another season. I know we'd all love it if Entourage could come back for one more season because that, that's what it's made for, TV. So if it could come back to TV... I'd be happy because there's a lot of stories to be told. Oh, for sure. And I'm just going to add one quick thing because I saw a really scathing review of the movie saying it's misogynistic and blah, 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 blah. Clearly some you know, single sad feminist wrote this review. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, they, they talked about how... I think that the, the article was like lines in the Entourage movie that you can't believe were actually said. And one of them was uh, Kelsey Grammer. There's there's a lot of celebrities in, in, on, in the Entourage movie, which is really good. It's what you expect. And there's a part where Ari's walking out of therapy and uh, he sees Kelsey Grammer, which people may know as Frasier. And he's like, oh, hey, Kelsey, how are you? And he's like, well, I'm fucked and you're here, so I guess you're fucked as well. And that was one of the quotes in there, like, you know, in this review saying, oh, like, why would you put that in? And it's not even funny that the joke is, like, tight. And I thought, well, considering that you've got a guy who played Frasier Crane, a really uptight guy for, what, I don't know, 10, 20, 15 years, oh, and in Cheers... And then you've got him just like, you know, dropping F-bombs like that. To me, that was funny. So I think maybe it just went over a lot of people's heads. I don't know. If if you are a fan of the series, I think you'll enjoy it. If you're not and if you've never watched Entourage in your life, I don't know. You may you may enjoy it. There's still interesting things, but you probably just won't care as much. Yeah, great point, mate. If, if you go into a movie and you take that kind of stuff to heart, then, you know... You don't. You can't embrace the fact that it's an artistic journey, and it's made for people to enjoy, not to take that seriously. Yeah, you don't. You don't even deserve cinematic adventures if you're going to take <laughs> things too seriously. Man, that that's it. That's enough from us. Um, don't forget to follow us on Twitter at submission AUS. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe on YouTube. Thank you so much for listening, guys. We always appreciate it. We always appreciate your comments. Um, I feel like we should ask you guys to comment something. What What do we want to hear from the fans? What What, what comments do we want Do we want to see in the in the YouTube comments? Who do you guys? guys want to see Dan Henderson fight next? What do you guys think about Ben Rothwell fighting Alofsky next? Would you be interested in that? And give us your thoughts on the event. Is this one of your favorite events of the year? Because for me, this and UFC 187 have been my favorites so far. And tell us what went through your mind uh, when you saw Ben Rothwell in that robe with the Star Wars music. Till then, guys, we'll be back next week.